Good afternoon to all of you who joined us from Europe. Good evening to all of you who joined us from the Far East. And good morning to all the participants that joined us from the US. My name is Noah Yitzchak. I'm OpenLM VP Marketing. I'm happy to welcome you today to the first ever conference of engineering software license management. Over the next four hours, professionals will share their experience of managing their license portfolio. Before we officially start this conference, I would like to share with you the demographic spread of the people who honored us today. We have more than 550 participants that come from all five continents. 25% of them are from Europe, 40% come from USA, Canada, and Latin America, and 35% are from Asia and Australia. Our participants today from, come from a variety of industries such as automotive, space and aviation, medtech, architecture, construction, engineering, academic, finance, and many more. You can, this can give you an idea of how many people are interested to learn about engineering software license management. And we hope that you will find this program that we prepared for you today interesting and educational. Our journey today will include the presentations from Bratislav Potocek from Adiant that will share his experience of creating a working SAM platform. Then, Renee and Michael from Rotterdam will share their experience of managing 16,000 users and how they succeeded in reducing the cost of their engineering licenses. After a short coffee break, we have a small surprise for you during the break. Our keynote speaker for today, Mr. Zaki Bajua from ServiceNow, will share his vision of digital transformation in IT. Zaki will also join us for a panel of professionals discussing license management challenges and its future. Last but not least, Jason Olson from Baker Hughes will walk us through his experience of merging from a medium-sized company to an enterprise and how he was able to help his company to grow and succeed without exhausting their software budget. Without further ado, I would like to invite Oren Gabay, OpenLM co-founder and CEO, to open the event. Thank you. In 1988, FlexLM was created by Globetrotter and Highland Software and in many ways set the path for engineering system licensing for the next 30 years until today. Many others followed and created a colorful and diverse licensing world composed of hundreds of different solutions. Today, we can see different implementation of network licenses in many different fields, transportation, aviation, electronics, civil engineering, finance, chemistry, biology, and many more, all high-end software systems. And here we are today, attended the first ever conference solely dedicated to engineering licenses. I attended and exhibited in many events worldwide, and I was always frustrated with the fact that engineering licenses is only marginally mentioned. My name is Oren Gabay, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of OpenLM. I'm thrilled to be here today with you. There are different types of engineering licensing. Network, network name, reusable token, disposable token, and more. All based on the same concept. Charging for the benefit of the software, the, the benefit the software brings to the customer as measured by usage time. Engineering licensing or network licenses is different from traditional licensing in many ways, but the main difference is that we are measuring the use of the software or its value and not technical details like installations or users. This is very similar to the way a machine manufacturer sells his machine. Your truck manufacturer is not asking you how many drivers do you have. He's asking how many trucks do you need? Machines are always running. People take breaks. When a driver is on vacation, another driver is driving the truck. When an engineer is on vacation, another engineer can utilize the same software seat. 
When managing named licensing for desktop software, we are looking to see if we comply with our licensing. The number of installation must match the number of licenses we have purchased. Engineering licensing compliance is mostly handled by the license manager itself. When managing engineering licensing, we focus on the service level to engineer and the allocation of the license. The main factor we need to track is the ratio between users and licensing. A ratio of four to one is acceptable. Four users that share the set one license. Vendors typically price their network licensing using this ratio. So you probably want to get it to get it or even exceed it. The major problem with engineering licensing platform is that they were traditionally designed as a departmental resource. This was suitable at that time. License management for engineering application was something engineering department managed on their own for their engineers. I was personally doing this for my department 25 years ago when I was a young engineer. Today, 30 years later, the design was not significantly changed, but the same license manager are now used to license software for enterprise. Many of you represent organizations that have hundreds and thousands of engineers scattered across countries and continents and need to use, and you still use these departmental license manager. Think about that. What are the changes of the word processing software you are using today compared to what you used 30 years ago? I don't see a huge difference between the license manager I used 30 years ago to what we have today. Not a huge one. Let's shortly review some of those limitations. Most license managers don't provide real management and monitoring tools. In some cases, we need to use command line interfaces and in other browser interfaces that are usually very limited. Gathering historical data is not typically supported by the provided license manager. Allocation capabilities are typically limited and when provided, don't fit the requirements of organization. The most capable allocation system I know is provided by FlexLM, but management of users and group is done in text file and it's not is not connected to the organizational directory. There are many more. So the last one I will mention now is each license manager comes with a different interface and data structure. How on earth can a license manager managing tens of different systems, each using different license manager, create a comprehensive view of the licensing status that can allow the organization to take data to take data decision based on data about licensing? In the recent decade, we see a trend led by some engineering software vendor to switch from engineering licensing to named user licensing models. Taking into account the fact that you, the utilization of named licensing is minimal compared to the utilization of network licenses, we can assume that the customer is not benefiting from this change. One of our customers told us that such a change tripled his price for exactly the same software. One might think, I pay a lot more now. I expect the license management to be easier. Fact is that this is also not true in most cases. In many cases, the licensing change made it even more complex to optimize the utilization of your license. OpenLM was started because of these pain. 15 years ago, I was leading a project and always felt frustrated by users leaving idle engineering software on the workstation, not allowing other users to access the software as they need, they need in order to do their work. Since then, and for the last 13 years, we are working hand-to-hand -hand 
with you in order to stretch your licenses to their limits. We are serving more than 1,000 customers worldwide. Many of them are huge global organizations with many thousands of engineers. Today's event is dedicated to you, the people that are dealing day to day with the complexity of managing the software licenses. In some cases, this, this engineering complexity is comparable to the complexity of the work, the engineers you are actually serving. Whether you are from engineering, doing CAD, EDA, BIM, maybe, maybe from IT, responsible for license management, software asset management, or engineering application management. The people that join this conference today are the ones that care about their organization and strive to get the best out of this expensive organizational resource. Today we are here in order to listen to your story. We want to know what are the challenges you face and how did you overcome them? It's the time to speak about what you care about. Four people out of thousands using OpenLM worldwide stepped forward today and went on the stage to present their work and we are all very grateful to them. I would like to point out that such exposure helps you to build reputation also outside your organization. This might prove to be very valuable in time of changes like now. We offer you many ways to do it. Write to our blog, create a video with us, create a case study or present in our conference. Are you ready to step forward? I invite you to personally contact me. This is the first time ever we set an open conference dedicated to engineering licensing, but it's not going to be the last one. We view this as a beginning of a tradition to gather every year and share stories and experience Maybe we can take a few seconds to try and imagine what it would look like if we could really gather, as in the good old times, and meet in person. I wish you all an enjoyable event. Thank you for joining. much Oren. Our first presenter is Branislav Potocek. Branislav is a senior IT business analyst from Adient. Adient is a leader in the automotive seating industry. The company is spread over 32 countries and has 12 engineering technical centers. Branislav is located in Europe and manages this huge operation from there. In the right side of your screen, you can see a tab for questions. Please write any question you have, and Branislav will answer at the end of his presentation. Branislav, please. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the OpenLM Engineering Conference. My name is Branislav Potocek, and I've been working as the Software Asset Manager and License Specialist for Adient for several years. Among my core responsibilities belong tracking, analyzing, cataloging and approving all software purchases, utilizing our Software Asset Management and OpenLM tools to provide analysis on the usage of software by the company, and I also take care of all of our engineering software maintenance renewals. Uh, let me introduce Adient as well. Adient is the world's leading developer and manufacturer of car seats. With offices spanning the globe and tens of thousands of employees, I'm sure you can imagine how complex and diverse our software portfolio is. <laughs> in fact, sometimes I feel we actually use all the applications in the world. It's a feeling that some of you may find very familiar. Since I'm starting as the second speaker today, I decided to aim my presentation at some of the basics of software asset management and detail some of the best practices we learned as we implemented our software asset management solution. So. The key topics I would like to discuss today are centrally managed software solution, how to best govern software inside the corporation, 
reactive to proactive software asset management, ensuring the right way to approach SAM, and last but not least, engineering software asset management, how to manage engineering software, engineering licenses within your SAM solution. The quote I have chosen for today is coming from Henry Ford, one of the early luminaries of manufacturing process, which I find is still very much relevant in today's world and also relevant when it comes to discussing software asset management. Coming together is a beginning, keeping together is a progress, and working together is success. So, how do these smart words apply to your SAM? Working as a software asset manager inside a company, especially inside a big corporation, means that you have to rely on many different people to succeed. It is crucial to build proper working relationships, and it's one of the first things I would suggest you do. Nothing makes your day at the office easier as when your colleagues know and understand your role and trust you. Centrally managed software asset management, governance of software inside a corporation. All right, let's start with topic number one. So how do you start with software asset management? Well, obviously, and this may sound uh, a bit on the nose, but I did feel the need to say it anyway. Please manage your software. Don't let it run wild. Even though it may seem really simple or unimportant at the beginning. I mean, what could go wrong, right? We buy, we use, sometimes people install something. What could go wrong? Unmanaged software poses a great risk somewhere down the line, and we will discuss exactly what kind. So, the basics. To get the software asset management going, what you need is a team and a tool. Whether you are a small company and you only have one IT guy that takes care of everything, or you have a professional team of some specialists because you are a big corporation, ensure that your folks are trained and competent. Even though many may think some is, SAM is unimportant for small businesses, I can share with you how my <laughs> software asset management skills came in handy when my mother's company of three employees had to upgrade their hardware and software last year, and I could explain straight out of the bat on how Microsoft licenses their Windows Server solution, how many client access licenses or terminal service licenses is she going to need. Alright, so let's move on. The following is mainly true for the bigger SAM solutions in big companies, but having an SAM tool is also crucial. There is a certain point after which manually managing the software portfolio because becomes too taxing, and that is exactly where the SAM tools come into play. There are several options to choose from, I'm not going to detail them all here. Whether you pick ServiceNow or you go with the Flexen solution, it always comes down to the individual needs, but make sure that you properly evaluate all of this ahead in time. Software can sometimes feel like a weird commodity. You know, it is very expensive, it is potentially also very dangerous. Yet, since it's not something that you can actually directly see as making money, as making revenue for you, it's very easy to fall into the trap of not thinking of it as something important to watch for. And yes, the wake-up call almost always comes in the form of a software audit and a potential hefty fines. So remember, prevention is always better than cure. So, let's make sure we think ahead instead of having to deal with the dangerous consequences. What are some of the key SAM advantages? Let's dive deep into some of those and uh, uh, see how they can help with your SAM solution. The following six points are what ADN based our SAM solution off of and is what helped us showcase uh, the importance of software asset management to our leadership. The first is the most obvious, cost optimization. If you are trying to convince your leadership of the importance of software asset management, there is no better argument than cost optimization. Let's be honest, every top leader, every top leader <laughs> our leadership loves to hear ideas on how to reduce cost, and software makes a significant portion of IT spend in every company. Software asset management helps us here by mitigating over license positions and allows us to reduce license accordingly. Number two, risk software audits. This is the twin sibling to cost optimization and we call it software compliance. Ensuring that your software is always compliant with what you purchase minimizes or even completely removes the risk of having to worry about the software audit. The projection for software audits is on an increasing curve. Software vendors are looking for ways to get more money out of all of us. Number three, risk, legal and regulatory. This is the third sibling uh, of the family and ensures that you are compliant with all the legal and regulatory requirements your software vendors might have 
and once again it also helps you protect against having to pay unnecessary fines. Number four, another big point, security. Uh, security is being spelled more and more in today's corporate IT world. Information security is important, it helps you protect your data. Software asset management helps to exercise control over applications allowed to run on company hardware and also helps to centralize control over potential security risks created by unwanted application installation. Number five, organizational governance. Software asset management helps us to remain compliant with industry standards and eliminate risk from potential legal disputes that you may have to face. And last but not least, software asset management is also closely tied with the hardware asset management. SAM helps us reallocate or reduce software after hardware movement, hardware decommission, hardware changes. SAM also ensures there is always someone knowledgeable to check on all the diverse and complex licensing models uh, that you may face for your software where hardware is also involved. You know, whether you are looking at the PVU counts that uh, IBM uses, you need to calculate uh, your cores for all of your hardware, for your Microsoft licensing, for your SQLs, for your Oracle database, databases. Uh, it's key to keep the hardware asset management up to date. So, what are the key software asset management requirements? In this slide, I actually opted to just showcase uh, more of an agent's experience while, while evolving our software asset management solutions instead of maybe just showcasing the best business practices, which you know you can you can Google in a, in a couple of minutes. So, what did we actually find were the key requirements for our SM solution? Number one, software strategy. This one is pretty self-explanatory. It's absolutely crucial that the software strategy is internally agreed within the company and that it's agreed on every management level, all the way from your top leadership uh, to the bottom, to the regular users or your regular IT support guys who uh, will be running, installing, using the software. People need to be aligned on what the requirements on the software are, how do we define them, how to process software purchases correctly. There is really nothing worse than people running wide and purchasing applications just because uh, they feel they need them. And the need may be real, uh, it just needs to be evaluated correctly. Uh, second key topic uh, that we had to implement is what I call a privilege. The SAM team, and for it to be even remotely successful, they need to have the right to evaluate software purchases. In ADN, the software asset managers actually do evaluate every single software purchase during the uh, purchase requisition approval flow. Uh, while this may seem taxing at the beginning, it is, uh, I don't want to say great way, it's maybe the only way to ensure that all your software is properly catalogued and all the purchases are actually uh, challenged, whether they are required. Number three is a relationship. I already mentioned this in the beginning when quoting Mr. Ford. Since the software asset management team is heavily involved with uh, many different levels within your organization, whether it's your purchasing department, uh, your legal department, the business owners, the users of the applications, the application owners from the IT perspective, I strongly, strongly recommend that you maintain uh, the best working relationship that you can. And the team's role is also understand, understood on every level. This is it's really crucial because uh, without a good working relationship, it just uh, makes it harder for everybody involved. Last but not least, again, uh, asset data. Uh, for software asset management to be successful, it needs to rely on proper asset data. Uh, the SAM team uh, department itself is responsible for correctly gathering and cataloging all of the software data but uh, as I mentioned earlier since the measurement is also targeting your devices your servers your computers your 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 virtual machine hosts uh, your your data clusters it is imperative that the company has up-to-date hardware data as well there is nothing more dangerous than uh, having a hidden missed unscanned server that contains a large sum of very expensive software you know it can always happen so be careful about it topic number two which i call in my presentation reactive to proactive ensure you use the right way to approach your uh, software asset management uh, 
what I mean by this, uh, I think it's pretty actually pretty easy to figure it out, uh, and it's uh, how Adient has worked its way from the beginning of its um, solution to a more refined approach that we have now. And the, the two uh, key things are uh, reactive software asset management, where we only react after the software is purchased, and we mainly reconcile the licenses and try to stay compliant, uh, work on the cost effectiveness and optimization, and proactive. Uh, where we plan ahead, the software asset management team is engaged prior to the software purchases being made. I can imagine that many of you face the situation where you get frustrated with the seemingly endless issues that you have to face, where you sit down and you wonder how easily some of this mess could have been avoided if only people uh, got together and talked beforehand. And we will get to this and what to do about it. But first thing first, reactive software asset management. The first iteration of an SAM implementation uh, within your company will be most likely a reactive one. Unless you're building or starting a company from scratch, you are usually uh, jumping in a workflow a process uh, that are already established and the company is running. So to, to get the SAM going, uh, the easiest way to, to just start with the reactive solution. It's still much better than having no SAM at all, I mean, obviously. And there are also situations where a proactive approach is simply not realistic. Uh, you may be facing a situation where there is a requirement for an immediate solution. There is no time to plan for it or overanalyze it. A purchase has been made. Even in this case, make sure you don't forget to react. So what the software asset management team ensures while being reactive? Each software purchase has to be properly evaluated and cataloged. Uh, this is just a must. Uh, you may only be uh, inserted in the middle of the purchasing process, but you need to do the evaluation. And uh, if you don't feel you can make an informed decision and you are forced to approve the purchase, still make sure that you catalog it and that you input all the data into your SAM tool. Number two, software that is already owned needs to be properly distributed to avoid compliance issues, to make sure that you are optimized. All the compliance issues that you discover are resolved, are being remediated. Solution is provided uh, to uh, all the teams that are involved. Cost saving opportunities. Again, they need to be periodically identified, evaluated. It's nothing worse than the company losing money because uh, you are not targeting and uh, reviewing the, the software portfolio correctly. This is the complete basic that will help you ensure that you maintain most of the key SAM advantages which we already discussed. Compliance, optimization, minimizing risk, keeping assets up to date. Proactive software asset management. So within a proactive software asset management solutions, all the inputs required are engaged ahead in time to analyze the software purchase. All the involved teams, people present their angles, which are taken into consideration. They are analyzed, they are evaluated, and a decision is made. These key players, and I already mentioned them, involve the purchasing department, uh, analyzing the suitable vendor options, suitable cost options, uh, maybe suitable alternatives where to purchase, going through a reseller, etc. Legal department analyzes on all the legal implications and obligations that may come with, with um, going through the purchase with signing a contract, engaging the business owners uh, where the business is showcasing the requirement of the new purchase, engaging your IT department, as SAM is part of the IT, but uh, I mean more of uh, everybody from IT that will be involved in actually implementing uh, the purchase software into your current infrastructure. Are there any obstacles that they may, uh, may provide that you don't even know about? So what does this help us achieve? Well. First and foremost, uh, there is always the discussion of the business requirement. Does your company actually require the software that the requester is trying to purchase? If the requirement is proved and agreed upon, maybe there exists an alternative. Maybe an alternative that your company already owns and you will be able to save money. In today's world, especially with the core corporate applications coming from the key players such as you know Microsoft, IBM, Oracle, VMware, uh, Adobe, there is always a viable alternative solution and it's imperative that you engage the discussion here. You may be looking at substantial cost savings. What about an extension of an already owned software? 
here is where the various various uh, software asset management or other tracking tools hint open lm for engineering uh, come into play sam teams should always evaluate analyze and present utilization slash deployment data if it's applicable to showcase and support an informed decision so uh, whether we are offering an alternative we are bucking up or trying to decline a purchase we are always working towards making the company more efficient in its software spend at the end uh, lessons learned what are the lessons that uh, learned by Adian. And again, this is not something that you maybe f find on the internet, it's uh, more of the, the best practices uh, that we gathered over the years. So first and foremost, uh, as I already mentioned, be proactive as much as possible. It's a good way to save time, it's a good way to save money, it's a good way to, to prevent uh, extra effort. When you can't be proactive, make, sh make sure you at least react. Don't let the purchase, unlicensed installation, uncatalogued server slip through your fingers. You are looking at an issue somewhere down the line. Be smart. Make sure you blend both the worlds using your common sense. As I said, not always a proactive solution uh, is the best one. Not always it's there is time to, to, to have it, but even if you can't, react. Be resourceful. We live in a world that is full of options, you know, full of alternatives. Don't ever get complacent, don't ever think the work is done. There is always a way to improve, there is always a way to optimize, there is always a functionality overlap that you can exploit. And now, I don't, uh, I hope I don't offend the users, our customers, but uh, I can imagine most of you witness the situation many times. Uh, you give the user option. If you give it to them, which choice are they going to pick? Uh, are they going with the Acrobat standard or Acrobat professional? Are they going to deploy SQL standard or are they going to uh, deploy SQL enterprise? It is in our nature that we try to get the perceived uh, better, more advanced solution, even though we maybe don't even require it. Now, onwards to the main topic at hand, we are, after all, at an engineering license conference. So, engineering software, engineering licenses, and how to implement them within your SAM solution. First, let's define some terms, since uh, this is from ADN's point of view, and uh, maybe maybe your company is, is defining these terms differently. Uh, how ADN defines engineers? Who are they and what tools they use? So. Our engineers are primary users of our PLM, CAT, CAE, Trim, Industrial Design, and other various applications. We are looking at a complete software portfolio, starting with the Team Center, Katia, Enix, ANSA, Hyperworks, LSDyna. We we do utilize complete Autodesk portfolio. We do utilize complete Adobe portfolio. Uh, we utilize SolidWorks. I mean. Uh, you name the engineering software and we probably have or had in the past at least one user who was utilizing it. Uh, making sure that all of this application portfolio is properly managed and properly utilized is not a small task and OpenLM has been a great help in here. So, what is so specific about engineering applications? Well, they usually utilize different licensing models compared to the standard corporate IT applications such as Microsoft, IBM or, or Oracle, where the above-mentioned vendors usually provide with an enterprise-level contracts that are subject to periodical true-ups. The engineering licensing models are usually more strictly on a concurrent, floating or a named user basis. As such, uh, different license metrics are required to achieve your software asset management goals. Make no mistake though, uh, even though oftentimes smaller than IT contracts, engineering contracts are equally as important and sometimes are criminally uh, overlooked within, within your SAM solution. Because uh, even though there are some key differences, there are also some similar goals to work toward from an SAM perspective. So, what's different? What is different when approaching the management of engineering licenses? Well, for, for starters, as I mentioned, the licensing systems are usually hard-coded to not allow using more than what you pay for. Whether you are looking at a Siemens monthly name base users for Team Center or concurrent floating licenses for Katia, 
you won't be able to usually use more than you purchase since the, the license manager technology is, is built so it doesn't allow it. This uh, may create a false sense of security when discussing compliance as a software asset manager. And even though indeed the danger is smaller than maybe uh, facing at Microsoft or IBM audit, it's still there and there are ways, there are options, there are things that you need to be careful about. What uh, I'm hinting at here is uh, the usage scope of the licenses. From our experience, every software manufacturer or software vendor that provides engineering applications uh, has this as a key practice. Majority of the engineering licenses are issued with a clearly defined usage scope, whether it's a countrywide, it's region-wide uh, or something similar. There are truly global licenses, but they are rare and usually uh, quite expensive. We are seeing a shift into globalization since it's more effective. So make sure that you build your infrastructure properly to minimize unauthorized license usage. If the situation, if your budget allows it, you may try to push for global licenses. Their overall equipment, equipment effectiveness is by far the highest. So some examples, let's say you do have a CATIA license in Germany with an in-country usage scope. Even if your uh, engineers are hardworking, uh, you're getting maybe what 10 to 12 hour daily rate of your license. With a global license and a proper infrastructure, you may actually achieve uh, something close to a 24 hour rate on the license as, as a global company. Like uh, let's use Adient again as an example uh, and Katia since it's the most widespread uh, solution uh, or annex with a global license, uh, you can have a license that's being utilized for almost 24 hours because it can start uh, with your Japan engineers, they, then you can move on to your, your China, your India, then Europe comes into place and uh, last but the least uh, North America. One license, almost 24 hour usage, great effectiveness rate. You know, nothing looks better than when you are showcasing something to your management and you can say, look, this is actually 100% utilized. They really love that. What's similar? So what is similar for managing engineering applications compared to the corporate IT contracts? Well, same as with the above mentioned core IT applications, there is a great overlap in functionality. While it's highly likely that the bigger the company, the, the more diversified your application portfolio is, this does not mean this, that as a software asset manager, you should not be on the lookout to offer the alternatives whenever possible. Maybe you can get Annex instead of Katia. Maybe you need both, but you can get one cheaper in one country and the other license cheaper in another country. As I already showcased, analyzing and using common sense goes a long way in here as well. Cost optimization is always based on eliminating, reducing overlapping functions and perfect utilization analysis can save your company a lot of money. So, why OpenLM? Adian's experience. Why did we choose it? Uh, what did we learn? As I already mentioned, Adian does have a crazy high diversity amongst its engineering license software portfolio and uh, OpenLM is a great tool that offers great support to all the various license managers that we use. Whether it's FlexLM, Dassault License Manager, BetaLM, you know, LSDyna, LMX, OpenLM can track all of it. And uh, as much as I would like to see uh, one uh, global license standard, I don't think we will ever see it. And uh, OpenLM just, it's the best solution to track all the different engineering licenses. It's been also instrumental in helping ADN consolidate our engineering software portfolio and gain total control over it. Uh, I said at the beginning that I'm also responsible for doing the software uh, renewals for all the engineering applications. Uh, whenever a renewal is coming up, you know, I just go to OpenLM. I do a utilization report, I do a utilization analysis and uh, it helps me uh, provide data to my business partners internally within ADN uh, so we can make an informed decision. I'll be honest guys, I can't wait to see what you actually come next, how you are going to expand the tool. So I've been talking for quite a while now uh, and just a quick summary before the end. 
Remember, software asset management uh, should be a key player in any company. It will help you minimize the risk uh, of having to pay settlement for non-compliance. And it is also crucial in saving money by optimizing the software license portfolio. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, my name is Brian Slobotacek and uh, I can't wait to hear your questions on the Q&A. Hi, Branislav. Yes, this is time for Q&A, guys. I see we already have a few questions. If you have more, please type them on the tab on your left. Sorry, right side. Hello, Noah. Hello, Hello, Noah. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Very well. Oh, OK. That's oh, good. Okay. That's good. Oh, it's nice to actually uh, be on camera now. Uh, let me uh, go uh, straight away to the question. So the question number one, is your department a part of IT or engineering? What is your level cooperation level with the system department level of access? So the department I work for is part of IT, but we work very closely with, uh, as I mentioned, all the different departments, whether it's engineering, uh, it's purchasing department, it's legal department, basically all the key players uh, that are uh, in the approval flow of a software purchase, uh, my department is working closely with them. Question number two, what is the average real usage rate for network license? Hours out of 24 for one license versus country limited. So that's actually what I touched in my presentation. For a country limited license, uh, if you are getting eight, 10, 12 hours, that's that's a very good rate for a countrywide license. For a global license, it depends on how big a company you are. If you are a company like Adyen that actually has offices spanning uh, the 24 hour globe, starting with Japan, moving over to Asia Pacific, then through Europe and uh, ending in Americas, you can get more than 20, 20 plus, I'm not going to say like directly 24, but very close to that. This comes uh, at the price of, uh, from our experience usually, Two, two to 2.5, maybe three times the cost for both the purchase and the maintenance of a single concurrent license. So if you already are full of your in-country or maybe regional licenses, it's sometimes hard to actually convince your management to, to upgrade the global license portfolio. However, it's uh, you know always up to the discussion with the vendors. Uh, I can say that we tried it and have been successful in multiple cases. So uh, question number three, in your slides, you have mentioned that applications are usually subjected to licensing models required true up agreements and subsequent costs. How are engineering applications not subjected to a true up cost? Is it all pre-purchased? For the portfolio that we use, it's 99% uh, of time uh, PLC, a purchase license, and then a payment of uh, annual license maintenance, or it's a subscription model. But as I explained again in my engineering slides, due to the way that the license managers work for engineering, which whether it's FlexLM or it's the Dassault licensing manager, whether you are using a concurrent or a named user model, uh, you are almost always technically prevented to actually use more than you have. So there is no need for a true up. We also cover Adobe uh, portfolio uh, under engineering, even though there is also the Acrobat uh, Writer, Acrobat Pro, but uh, we use the Creative Cloud a lot inside Adyen. This is the one of the exceptions where we are actually looking at the true up. However, for, for the main key players, uh, CA, uh, CAD, uh, PLM applications, we haven't had the case of uh, having to drop our licenses. So uh, another question for IBM. From what I understand, IBM licenses can be monitored by a SEM solution and an engineering SEM solution. Can you state the difference between the two? Is the licensing model similar? Uh, I don't think I actually said that. So we monitor our IBM licenses uh, with uh, the SEM solution. In this case, that's FlexNet. Uh, manager solution, and uh, we mainly target uh, the, up, the applications from IBM that use the PVU uh, licensing model, the PVU licensing metric. There are a lot of IBM applications with such a diverse portfolio. Uh, some of them you won't be able to track with any SEM tool, and it's as Oren mentioned at the beginning, uh, sometimes you really need to go down to the command line and uh, get the utilization there. 
Uh, another question from your experience, are all engineering applications licensed in a floating manner or can we mix and match different licensing models? What engineering software licensing models have you come across? Again, this is what Oren talked about at the beginning. So uh, the majority are at the moment for at and licensed with the concurrent model, but we do see a trend among the vendors to move to the named user model, which uh, he also said it at the beginning, it's more advantageous to them. Uh, and it's less advantageous to us. It, they will try to sell it as, uh, as something that's good for you as a customer, but uh, from our experience, it's, it's not that good because you will most likely end up paying a lot of money. But again, it all depends also how your infrastructure is in place. So another question, please explain if application approval, ET and business workflow is possible. Yes, I would say definitely it is. Uh, again, the way this works for us, every application purchase is approved uh, by the software asset management team, which I'm part of. Uh, we do evaluate every software purchase. I'm not going to now tell you that we have uh, everything in scope. Of course, there are some or many small purchases since we are a huge company, which we don't look uh, or don't deep dive into. But all the key players, whether it's from the core IT application portfolio, your IBM, Oracle, Microsoft, VMware, Adobe, or the engineering ones, the Sol, Siemens, Autodesk, we do actually evaluate and make sure that we don't have uh, any local purchases made or that we properly uh, explain to our users that we, if there is a global contract in place for an application, there is no need to purchase and spend extra money uh, somewhere down locally. Another question, please explain contract data management possibilities. Uh, so contract management is uh, a complicated topic because uh, it does not concern only the software department, but uh, the purchasing department and the legal department as well. So what we do, we do implement uh, our contracts into our SAM solution, into Flexera, uh, but mainly uh, the departments that are dealing with the contracts uh, would be the, the purchasing department and the legal department. Oh, a lot of questions here. <laughs> Please explain if possible to include networking vendor and also the hardware and other indirect costs can be included in data. Again, another complicated topic. Uh, I said that software and hardware assets are very closely tied together because the, the deployment and the compliance issues that come, especially for the, for the core IT contracts like IBM or Microsoft are directly tied to the hardware and the hardware database needs to be up to date. Uh, we use two solutions. One is uh, a database for hardware and uh, Flexera is our database for software. These are interconnected on the back end. Uh, as for implementing networking vendors, we do also uh, cover our networking contracts, but only from a very high level perspective, since uh, we have not yet found a possibility for our some solution to, to track the networking equipment. I, I hope that answers your question. Uh, another question. When you talk about global licenses and its utilization, do you mean sharing of licenses? When I talk about global licenses, I specifically mean uh, the engineering licenses that are of a concurrent or a floating model uh, that uh, can be utilized uh, by definition and your contractual obligation all over the world. So this means that the same engineer can use the same license uh let's uh, have an annex or katia for as an example there is a base license that allows you to to start the tool and uh, if you have a global license of a concurrent model uh anybody from your company all over the globe can access the license so that means when your engineer in japan closes his tool and uh, goes home another engineer from europe or from uh north or south america can pick up the same license and keep working with it which is where which is how you actually achieve the effectiveness it's the maximum effectiveness that you can get again this is uh very specific the bigger your company are the, the more easier this is to achieve with your infrastructure Another question, regarding open element licenses, we are seeing some vendors move to cloud-based named user licenses that do not use our internal license service. How can OpenLM help with these issues? So 
I uh, OpenLM recently uh, have implemented their their cloud monitoring, which requires the deployment of OpenLM agents. And uh, I can tell you that we uh, in ADN have not yet implemented this solution, but we are definitely looking at it because uh, Adobe uh, Creative Cloud uh, application portfolio is, a, is such a great example here where you don't really know whether your users uh, are utilizing your cloud licenses properly. Or they, they may request a software, you may assign them a cloud license, but you have no, without, without having an agent that's actually tracking something on the user's computer, you are not in the know. You don't know whether they are requiring the software, which is uh, a big problem when you're trying to analyze the truth for, uh, for the Adobe TrueUp. So, uh, if you need to know more, I suggest you contact one of the OpenLM experts on how to implement the agent-based solution, but they can track the utilization of the cloud applications as well. So which tool for SAM would you recommend to set up a process that works across all departments that are involved? Uh, I would say both the solution from Flexera and from ServiceNow can, can help you achieve this. It's really down to what you prefer, what you have budget for, and maybe what your user base is more comfortable using. Can OpenLM track subscription-based licenses as well? Uh, yes. For example, Siemens is, has been recently offering a subscription-based licenses for their application portfolio, for their CAT and PLM application portfolio. Uh, and uh, since they work on the same license manager as the rest of their licenses, which is FlexLM, which has been, you know, the the go-to with the industry for so many years, uh, yes, OpenLM can track that as well. That is, that, that's from our perspective what we call a subscription license. What are the denial rates that can be considered acceptable for engineering license? So this, uh, I don't think this is something that can be uh, said uh, in general that I can globalize and, and say this is true for every company. This is a very specific question that your engineering department should be the one to, to agree upon. We are at the moment still aiming at having 100% coverage for all of our engineers. How do you deal with different versions? Do you use OpenLM data to help with upgrade process of different vendors and driving training engineers of, of new versions of engineering tools? Uh, this is uh, something that's completely out of my jurisdiction within our company. The engineering department is actually driving uh, their upgrading and uh, renewing the versions of their software. So I, I'm sorry, I cannot comment on that. Which engineering software vendors are the top licensed compliance auditors? So I would say, uh, the big ones, whether it's Siemens, the Salt, Autodesk. How can you be uncompliant in a concurrent user mode apart from the country usage limit? Uh, I'll be honest that that is the only way that we've actually realized that you can be uncompliant. It's not something that we are really diving deep into. We do have set authorization rules for all of our engineering license infrastructure that prevents users from different regions to use uh, cross-country licenses. The only licenses that we authorize for our users to use all over the globe are the licenses that are global. Sorry, I need to scroll down a bit because the question keep coming. In general, which one is better in terms of cost of cost effective perpetual or a subscription based on eight hours per day usage? This is highly dependable on uh, what the vendor is going to offer you. How much of a discount can you get for the license? Uh, it's also very, very specific and based on uh, how do you plan to evolve your particular software? Let's say we are talking again a Katia or a Nix or a Team Center. Are you content with remaining on the same version for many, many years? Or do you do regular updates, upgrades to the newest version? If you upgrade to the latest version, uh, a subscription model may be actually better for you because it, it can be uh, less expensive. But if you are content on staying on the same version for multiple years, uh, you can actually save money because if you own the license once, you are not forced to pay maintenance. Maintenance is something extra. So even if you stop paying, you are in 99% of cases, you are entitled to remain on the last version that you paid maintenance for. So you can actually 
so to speak, use the software for free for many, many years down the line. Actually, I did not understand generally the benefit of relationship between the software and IBM. Uh, if you mean the relationship between OpenLM and IBM, uh, that's not what I was I was talking about. Like the, the beginning of a presentation should uh, be focused more generally on uh, the software asset management perspective, because in ADN we we do not differentiate between uh, engineering license management and license management overall. So the same team is managing all of the software, whether it's it's IBM, it's Microsoft, or it's engineering software. It wasn't that way always, but we've uh, merged the department uh, a couple of years back. What's the most difficult part when facing these audits from, from your experience? When facing audits, the, the most difficult part is always uh, gathering all the data showing, because usually the vendors actually require you to lock your usage and uh, depends on the depth of the audit and on the terms of the audit. Uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, using a software asset management tool or maybe even OpenLM is, is good because an auditor can actually uh, allow you to just provide data for from your utilization reporting tool. So you won't have to, to dig deep to, to provide manual logs and it makes the job for everybody uh, easier. Have you had experience asking OpenLM for a new license server given? Uh, not directly, but we, we did ask to, to add some things that we would like to see in uh, our reports. How do you manage regional, license, regional licenses in a cloud? Uh, our, our cloud, uh, the main cloud that we use is, is Adobe and uh, we do have a global license portfolio there. And uh, the other one is Microsoft, which is the same. So uh, no experience on this topic. Do you consider the, the CSAM certification a good standard for your SEM team? And are, are there other certifications we should consider? Yes, that's uh, that's one of the of the good ones that you can get. And also, uh, depending how big of a company you are, how big your SEM team is, um, do you have? Uh, people in your SEM team that take over all the software vendors, do you split the software vendors between your people? Uh, it's uh, always a good practice if your SEM team members are certified for the vendors that they work with. So if you have uh, somebody who's focusing strictly on Microsoft, they should have at least a basic training and maybe a certification on how Microsoft uses licenses. Microsoft is the, the one that I'm gonna say everybody in every software asset management team should be certified for Microsoft because Microsoft is simply the, the biggest thing there is. Uh, it's being used in every company. You, there is no way you are going around it. How do you handle freeware open source software licensing requirements? So again, this is highly dependable of what kind of a tool, what kind of software do you mean? Uh, a good example would be uh, Linux. We use both SUSE and Red Hat Enterprise agreements and uh, we handle it as every other big big key player. We do track utilization, we do track our purchases, and we use uh, we create an effective license position on a regular basis to see if we are actually properly covered. Now I can see why am I running out of time? Yes, last question, okay? Okay. <laughs> So, Brian Slaw, great presentation. How are you ensuring ISVs that wish to discontinue their perpetual license to their subscription model? To stay perpetual, to maintain the investment and to avoid fees of a subscription? An example would be Autodesk. So, this is something that, uh, again, we are we have investigated in the past. Uh, as I explained previously, you really need to analyze how do you plan to use the software down the line? Do you plan to keep the updates regular? If if yes, a subscription model may be something that's actually very good for you. If no, uh, remaining on the perpetual can be a money saver down the line. Thank you, Bani Islam. That was no, fascinating, I have you. to say. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you as well. Okay, we'll see you again later at the panel. Yes. Our next presenters are from the municipality of Rotterdam the second largest city in Netherlands, René Slokers and Mike and Van Valen, managing 16,000 users. And now they're going to present how they actually use 
the data and share it with the users in order to reduce the software cost and to achieve more efficiency. A reminder, please type your questions in the right tab. I know I noticed you all know how to do it. This is great. And they will answer at the end of their presentation, same as Branislav did. René, Michael, the stage is yours. Welcome to the presentation of the municipality of Rotterdam. Could you share your data? I'm René Slokkers. I'm a technical application administrator for the municipality of Rotterdam. Hello, my name is Michael van Oorhaven and I'm a direct colleague of René Slokkers. Rotterdam is a major port city in the Dutch province of the Netherlands. This is the city hall of Rotterdam. Rotterdam has about 650,000 inhabitants and is the second largest city in the Netherlands. Largest province surface area. We got the largest port of Europe and Feyenoord is one of the three football clubs. The Netherlands is known as the best, best bridge builders in the world. The Erasmus Bridge can be opened and is seen as the icon for the city of Rotterdam. We also have two other bridges who connect the north and the south side of Rotterdam. The city main incomes from Rotterdam is the port of Rotterdam that uh, contains transshipment petroleum and the container port. We got some large multinationals, example is Unilever and Shell, and we have different trade centers. Our team manager is Bruce Sofrey. The team exists of about 25 person and our uh, department has 550 applications. Total of the municipality of Rotterdam are about 1200 applications. Uh, the users of the municipality of Rotterdam is about 16,000. And we have 12,000 TIN clients and about 180 FAT clients for heavy applications who needs GPU or CPU power. One of the products we make in Rotterdam is in a drawing that we use uh, in AutoCAD. This is the city hall of Rotterdam. It's uh, located in the coal single. And everything we have in, in Rotterdam is available in uh, AutoCAD or ESRI or any other application. This is uh, what we hear here is uh, the utility, sewer, telecom, electrical underground, but also the trees are available in a database. This is an other application we use in Rotterdam. That's uh, ArcGIS from Esri. And in this example, we see the footpath who have a width of more than one and a half meter. The red ones are smaller than one and a half meter. And the green ones are wider than three meters in this example. And this is very important for the COVID-19 problem we have. Before license management system, what do we have? We have different units with their own licenses. And uh, a couple of years ago, about six or seven years ago, we, we put the, the different units we put together as one unit, finance and HR. And so uh, what were the challenges? The challenges are to get the licenses together, the contracts together, and monitoring the licenses if maybe we have too much license or maybe the licenses are too low. What was important to us in the chosen management system? Data sharing, license usage, the reduce of life license if possible, reduce costs, and easy to use. And that's OpenLM. The OpenLM strong point is that the live usage of licenses you can see in this screen. What type of applications we are monitoring? We are monitoring uh, applications with users, about five or 600 users, and example AutoCAD has about 153 licenses, and that's an application we monitoring. We have 10 vendors from OpenLM, we also monitoring the ESRI ArcGIS license, we are monitoring MATCAD licenses and a lot of other ones who are very important and very expensive so we can reduce costs if possible. This is what an application administrator sees when he logs in to OpenLM. You can see the vendors and the license servers 
we are monitoring. What is FAM? FAM is Functional Application Managers. We call it key users. And we give them roles and permissions to see their own application where they are key user for. As an example, you can see here the Autodesk role we made for a user. The user is called Autodesk and we got a role. We call it the Autodesk underscore role. And they can see the usage of AutoCAD licenses. And here in role and permissions, you can allow the user for watching his licenses and deny him for other license services. So you can make his own start menu for him. This is an, a key user role. You see the screens are only, you can only see the license server he may see. And we did it with the deny and allow function. User privacy. What data do you record in the system? We only record the usage of the licenses in our system by files. Do application administrators see the user's activity? No, we don't see the user activity. It's not important for us. Now we go to the live demo. Okay, this is the, this is the Autodesk user. We made the earlier uh, and, and we use this is this is live and you can see that the uh, that the start menu is limited um, with um, functions he can use. This user can only see the license users of Autodesk applications. On this screen, you see the application administrator. Start menu. Here you can do everything. You can make roles and all kind of things. And you can, we can see here all the license servers we are using. Yeah. This is how you make a user. This is the Autodesk user. You can manage the user. Some fields are uh, you must fill in. User Autodesk. We made it already. Administration to the roles of the user. We here you see the Autodesk underscore role, and you can manage that role. Sources. And here you can deny or allow the user what he may or may not see in the start menu and the license servers he may or may not see also. And we give this user rights to only manage the Autodesk licenses. We make, we make a roll now. We add a role. Save the role. Sources. Add. We do a search on the roll, and we can give him the Autodesk 2015 licenses to show them in his role. Yeah. And you do that by deny or allow. Save. Yeah. 
we have the user openlm underscore test and we connect the role to the user select the role manage users at the autodesk role and this user is added to the role Yeah, we can also uh, add filters. Then in one click, you can um, open the, the filter you want. So you can, uh, you can, the server is Autodesk licenses, the vendor name, that's ADSK Flex, License type floating. And when you click on the plus, you can uh, add uh, functions. That's uh, the, the, the software you use. We choose the AutoCAD Map 3D package. Select. You can set a time. You can say uh, six, seven days back, 30 days back, last 30 days. Apply. And here you can see when you click on the filter icon, license usage, and normally here. You can uh, add the license server, license type, and the license from the application from Autodesk you want to show. Add heat map. And this is today. And here you can uh, add the filter. Add a new filter. You can give it the name you want. Add. Okay. And now you can here, here by search, you can click on the pull down menu. And here you have the openlm underscore test filter. You can open it. Add. And now, and don't, don't forget to accept there. And now we show another filter that you can see the, 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 the screen uh, changes from Autodesk 2015. Accept. We have a part of. Accept. And now you can choose your filter, the filter you want. This was our presentation from Municipality of Rotterdam, thank you very much. René, Michael, uh, please turn on your camera. Hey, Michael, how are Hi, you? Hey, how are you? Good, René, hello. Uh, hello. Hi, guys. Okay, so you have a few questions already. Uh, yes, yes, I believe. Yeah, I believe my, I, I don't know if Michael sees the questions. I see them, so uh, I'm not sure if he sees them. <laughs> Michael, yeah, so I, can you read the questions? Okay. Do you think that your users are holding other idle license on their workstation, preventing from other users to get a license? Um, I don't think that they 
are holding the licenses because due to uh, OPLM, we see that we have licenses enough and therefore we don't think that the users use unnecessary licenses. Any other? What is the usage ratio, ratio between users and licenses for leading applications like Autodesk and Esri? I don't think I follow the question or I understand the question. Do you, Rene? No. What is what is usage rotation between no i don't understand the question can you please repeat it uh no because it's gone now <laughs> okay uh maybe i can help uh what is the usage ratio between users and licenses for leading applications like autodesk and esri i don't know Absolutely. Shall I take another question? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Do the key users uh, use their own Windows authenticated credentials or is it necessary to set up special OpenLM passwords for each? Um, we uh, don't use uh, Windows authentication for OpenLM. We create our own users with their own rights. And we have a small, uh, small part of users. We have only now we, we just started with the, the roles and the features. So we uh, only have three users uh, now, and I think it will grow. But uh, we work too short for that. Uh, so Windows, Windows authentication, we are not using at this moment. I know that. Uh, I will take another question. Um, how did your users react to the new license management system? They are very excited about it because uh, the key users are going around the table with the distributors, so with the people from AutoCAD, and they can show uh, from the reports what the usage is uh, of the software and they can uh, renew the contracts with lower or sometimes with higher uh, uh, licenses if necessary but maybe for uh, maybe in our uh, maybe for uh, maybe uh, for us it's more to uh, decrease the licenses so that's very important um uh, what about tools like GitLab, Atlassian, Eggplant, IBM, and SonarCube? Mm, I'm, I'm not uh, aware with them. I only know uh, IBM. Uh, we are only managing or monitoring uh, tools from uh, distrib distributors like Autodesk and Esri. That they are the, um, we have the most licenses for that applications, about 170 uh, and uh, about 100 and they are very important for us so um, i don't know uh, we don't have ibm sonar cube no we don't have that kind of application so no i got a question how many users are using one license for autodesk the ratio i think they mean the question is how many use uh, licenses do we have and uh, what's the maximum amount of users? Uh, due to OPLM, we see uh, we have about 153 licenses for AutoCAD. And due to OPLM, we see that the maximum usage is uh, 120 at one day. But normally, approximately, is about 100 users. Um. How often does auditing happen in your company institution? Is it done by vendors or governmental responsibility institutions? 
I'm, I don't know. I really don't know. I cannot answer this question. I know we, we, we've been auditors as municipality of Rotterdam, but I don't know. I think there are governmental responsibility institutions who do that and vendors. Do they mean uh, the compliance of the of the licenses? I think that's what they meant. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I guess due to the, the the use of a license file, we don't have any more users than there are in the license file. For example, we have had 153 AutoCAD licenses. When number 154 will start AutoCAD, you will get a message in the screen that says uh, no more uh, licenses are available. Yeah, we have floating licenses for the products we are monitoring. And we are not audit, we, we don't have to audit that uh, um, that software because we, we have the contracts and that's that's the uh, the license we have and nothing more than that. And for, for the Microsoft or the Adobe Professional uh, uh, Reader, of sorry, uh, Adobe Professional, I think there is, a, I'm sure there is an audit thing for them. Um, do you plan to send your Active Directory to OpenLM to create more roles so that more department users can use? I don't think we are going to do that because uh, we have uh, the, the applications we have are uh, that are interesting are the Autodesk application and the Esri products. And we have um, maybe not more than four or five key, key users for that application. So we are not syncing your Active Directory. Uh, it's uh, if the, that users uh, know the usage, that is uh, enough. And they are going to spread it to the organization or to the team manager. So no other users okay. are using are that. Guys, uh, last question, okay? Okay, Michael, it's your honor. <laughs> no, I don't have any more. Oh, okay. Um, uh, I will delete the questions I've answered. What is the... Uh, are you monitoring the Autodesk use with the token flex option? Um, I think they mean that that's the, the FlexLM option where you can you can add it in the on, we have a dedicated OpenLM server and there you add the vendors you want to manage and there you choose for the FlexLM option. Yeah, that's correct. René and Michael, thank you very much. That was very interesting. And I'm sure many of our participants today learned from your experience. We'll see you again later at the panel. Thank you. Okay, now it's time. Much. Bye, guys. So now you. it's time for a short 15 minutes break. Right after the break, we have our keynote speaker for today. So make sure you're back on time. We prepared a short trivia quiz for you during the break. So grab a cup of coffee and join us for the quiz. Good luck.
Welcome back. I managed to answer 10 questions right. I hope you did better than me. I'm very proud to introduce our next speaker. Zaki Bajua is VP Global IT Transformation in ServiceNow. Zaki has more than 18 years of experience in merging businesses and high tech and is leading the ServiceNow team towards the future of information technology solutions. Zaki, please. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. Excited to be here with you to present to you on how ServiceNow is helping our customers accelerate their digital transformation, leveraging our platform. So I'll spend a few minutes introducing you to the background of ServiceNow, how we got started, our purpose, and then we'll get right into what you as IT leaders care about and how we're helping you today. So first and foremost, a brief history. ServiceNow, at the end of the day, our purpose is to make the world of work work better for people. There hasn't been another time in history when our belief that technology is in the service of people is more important to how we all work. If you think about the current COVID environment and the current work from home, work from anywhere environment. In this time, every organization is thinking about how to transform how to be more productive, how to be more efficient, and quite frankly, how to keep business just going. So in this new normal, everyone needs a smarter way to workflow. And this is the experience we want for all employees and customers today and in the future of work. So let me play a quick video and show you what we mean by that. Derek, seems like your team's operating just fine remotely. Yeah. Everything is running smoothly with the Now platform. See? Incident resolved. How did you... Gotta enjoy the small wins. You keep being you, Derek. Keep being you. Service Now, the smarter way to workflow. So at the end of the day, that's our purpose because when work because when work gets done, works better, it is a cause to celebrate. And that's really our empathetic purpose is to make the world of work better for people. Now, the second aspect is in order for us to deliver great experiences, C-suite leaders know that experiences matter. Great experiences drive fierce customer royalty and powerful employee engagement. Across industries around the world, companies are looking for ways to digitally transform themselves into modern digital enterprises to remain competitive and frankly, accomplish their business goals in this 21st century. Yet behind every great experience is a great workflow, is a statement that's fundamental to our belief that if you're investing in technology to help you solve workflow problems, you're going to drive the business outcomes that you're striving to achieve. Digital workflows are the key building blocks for great experiences. At their simplest, workflows are blueprints to automate process, automated workflows that are fast and self-learning based on data science are the only way to simplify the complexity that's inherent in getting work done. And this is what ServiceNow helps with. We enable workflows across an enterprise, across departments, systems, and processes. And with the Now platform, workflows naturally, the way it's supposed to. And when workflows naturally, great experiences follow that unlock productivity for IT employees and customers. And let me give you an idea of how we're bringing this together in our platform. The challenge is that in most enterprises, work is unstructured and happening within disparate systems of records. These departments have their own data, their systems of record that are stored on various legacy technologies. But work happens in silos, lowering productivity and user experience. 
because individually they do not support how work flows across your enterprise. And replacing these core systems is an expensive and lengthy process. So our now platform excels at digitizing work that flows through a company or across different functions in a unified experience. That's why we call the now platform, the platform of platforms for business solutions and all workflows. Our unique differentiation is providing you with one platform which shares one data model, one architecture, one as well as many built-in powerful capabilities, such as the easy <clears throat> ability to build cross enterprise workflows, single data model, single CMDB, enterprise service management and machine learning, all with AI and predictive analytics, delivered in a native mobile and conversational interface and a set of no code, low code development tools for anyone to build their own apps. At the end of the day, ServiceNow connects organizations, creating a seamless enterprise system of action that integrates silos and systems, enabling great employees and customer experiences, increasing business agility and unlocks productivity. And that is how we're helping customers accelerate their digital transformation by delivering that horizontal workflow across your various systems of records. And let me give you an example of what we've recently done. You may have read about the four emergency response apps that ServiceNow delivered to customers early when the COVID-19 crisis happened. We already have thousands of customers using these applications in production. We are particularly proud of how we partnered with the Washington State Department of Health to make an emergency operations application, which they developed on our platform and then made available to all government agencies fighting this pandemic. And this is all about sharing best practices, which is why we'll do everything we can to get Washington State app in use everywhere. But the key point I wanna make on this slide is, this CIO was able to take a cross-functional effort that cut across their vendors, their people, their employees, their partners, their different state agencies, and leverage ServiceNow horizontally across all of those different functions, processes, and personas to bring everything together and be able to improve their response, prevent future losses, and respond to incidents much faster. And this is an example of accelerating digital transformation, leveraging the ServiceNow platform that cuts across different functions in a company. And at the end of the day, that's what we're doing. We're delivering digital workflows your customers and employees can rely on, whether they're IT workflows, employee workflows, or customer facing workflows in the case of Washington State. And at the, and at the end of the day, we have those four key use cases. We focus on employees and delivering intuitive, natural experiences for them. Likewise, your end customer and how do we deliver resilient operations that make sure those customers are getting the services they require. How do you as IT leaders make sure you're productive, delivering cost efficiencies and delivering business resiliency to deliver employee and customer experiences. And then we're also giving you the ability to quickly develop apps that allow you to build new digital workflows on our platform. And so these are the four areas that we're helping customers with on a regular basis. And a quick example of that are these four customers. As you can see on the left here, Jacqueline saved 70% of our cases at level one were automated leveraging our employee experience outcomes. Likewise, Jerry and team at 7-Eleven, 93% of their case volume from their customers, their franchisees, their vendors, their partners was reduced leveraging our capability from AI and ML point of view. From an IT perspective, 50% less cost driving a higher level of productivity, cost and resiliency within Experian. And likewise, Felix from Academy was able to create 
new applications that resulted in 50,000 tasks a month being automated across 27 different departments. So at a high level, this is what ServiceNow is helping our customers do is digitize their workflow, their processes across their employee base, their external customer facing folks, IT leaders that yourself and allowing low code, no code app development to create new digital services for you. Now, I know you're sitting here and wondering what does this mean for IT and how are you helping us as IT leaders? So let me turn and talk about what we're seeing and hearing from you and your peers in the industry. I've been fortunate enough to have over 60 CIO conversations in the last four months. And here's what I'm hearing from your peers. Number one, in this work from home environment, they need to deliver smart services to their employees and their customers. Number two, cost savings is top of mind. And how do we get quick cost savings critical in our current environment? And I'll talk about that in more detail. Third, how do I deliver operational resiliency, both from a human capital resiliency point of view, all the way to risk resiliency, as well as operations and business resiliency. And last but not least, in this COVID environment, everyone is accelerating their digital transformation and asking for us to help them release services much faster in a digital enterprise that they're focused on. So these are the high level four use cases I'll talk about from an IT perspective, where we have been helping customers really accelerate their digital transformation and digital journey for our IT leaders. So you may ask, why ServiceNow? Why are you unique to go deliver these outcomes? And the way I'll answer that is similar to how you saw our broader platform or platform conversation earlier, we aspire to help customers really be that platform for IT. And what this means is we aspire to be that system of record that connects all of your value chains into a single system of record, meaning your strategy and planning teams, your app development and, and development teams, as well as your operations and SRE organizations, all the way to your service and customer care organizations. How do all of these teams come together on a single system of record to then accelerate change horizontally across the system of record? And that is what we aspire to do within IT today for you and your IT and business leaders. And we allow you to leverage your investments that you have today and the other point products within IT bring that data into ServiceNow, allow the different personas from program managers to enterprise architects to asset managers, license managers, vendor managers, procurement folks, all the way to your employees and customers, connect all of those folks, let them collaborate and let them deliver services and accelerate change faster through that single system of record and single platform for IT. And only when you connect the dots across all of these different value chains into the single platform for IT, do you start to accelerate your productivity, your cost savings, and speed of delivery of those services. And the first area where most of our customers are starting is making sure that we're bringing the process side of the house, so your systems or your service management side of the house, things like your incidents, your problem, your requests, your changes and tie those to your machine generated side of the house, your infrastructure applications, your config code, your uh, metrics, your logs. How do I bring those two worlds together, build a foundation, bring that data together and leveraging that data, then I can start to have greater efficiencies around my application portfolio, around my assets, my licensing, my software, my hardware licensing, around my security operations, all the way to risk and DevOps. So the foundation for building this platform for IT is really on the service and management, the service and operations management tiers and starting there. And let me give you a customer example of that, right? RBS in Scotland was able to take 13 different legacy tools 
leveraging our service management and operations management core foundational capability, bring them together on this single platform for IT and reduce upwards of 75% of their day-to-day -day tasks and repeating uh, issues and tasks and automate as much of that from their environment. And leveraging a single database, a single what we call service graph data model to bring those worlds together. So enormous productivity and cost savings there. So that's the foundation for the platform for IT behind these four use cases. Now I'm gonna spend maybe 10 more minutes talking through each one of these in a bit more detail, and then we'll close it with a few more examples. So the first one is all around, in this post COVID environment, as people unfortunately are working from home or in some cases companies are furloughing employees, they're letting those employees keep their services, their laptops, their licensing, their health services, their medical services. But yet what we're seeing is the demand into that typical service centric organization, whether it's your level one, level two, level three, your asset owners, your uh, HR service desk, your network operations team, your security operations team, the demand into those teams are going up three, five or 10 X in some examples. However, the resources to manage that demand is, is either consistent or less. So how are we helping customers automate as much of that demand coming into their su support team? And this is all around modernizing and automate that smart experiences for your end employees and your end customers. And so what we're seeing across our customer base is 40% of that demand coming into their teams are based on people generated and 60% of the demand coming into their system are based on machine generated. As a customer that's working with us to automate as much of that through things like virtual agent, chat ops, our predictive intelligence capability, which is allowing you to look at demand coming in, look at how that's related to past experiences and make decisions from there, as well as auto categorize, auto route, and auto solve a lot of these incidents. And I'll give you an example of a company that's taken almost 16% of their incidents and automatically deflected those leveraging our virtual agent or virtual bot capability, uh, leveraging our AI ML capability to go and automate almost 16 to 20% of their demand within a seven week window, right? Amazing cost savings and more importantly, great customer experience and employee experience on that front end. So that's that first use case all around smart experiences and modernizing and automating. The second use case around cost savings is all about what this audience cares about, which is how do I reduce my software license spend, my hardware license spend, and eventually my cloud spend as we see more and more companies accelerating their journey to cloud. And we're seeing customers, especially in this post-COVID environment, save upwards of their uh, uh, upwards of 20 to 30 percent of their IT spend through software, hardware, and cloud spend, leveraging our capabilities here. So that's the second use case there. The third one is all around how do I make sure I am resilient, both from a risk and integrated risk management point of view, and making sure my controls, my processes, my business contingency, my business uh, contingency planning and everything is intact and be able to report on that in this highly regulated environment. How do I measure, track and do continuous improvement related to risk? Secondly, from an operational risk point of view, how do I have the ability to predict, prevent and automate issues as they come in and really reduce that 60% of the CIO budget focused on operations. And third is all around security, both from a vulnerability management as well as from a security management. So this is our resilient operations solution, which helps customers from a risk operations and security point of view, be more preventive and automated in their solution. And a great example of that is Trangalta. They were able to take 80% of their P1, P2 outages and automate the remediation of those outages through ServiceNow and bringing both their operational data, their service management data, as well as their business data together 
and allowing things like AI ops to go and automate that. So that's the third use case that I talked about around preventing and automating. And last but not least, a lot of our customers, just like yourself, are focused on digital acceleration, digital speed. And they're saying, how do we let our developers accelerate their releases of software while we automate as much of the backend change process, release process, and regulatory and, uh, uh, regulatory and risk process in capturing those changes. So this is where we're helping customers really accelerate their change by automating change through a data-driven manner. The net net there is we're allowing developers to release their services faster while we capture all of the relevant metadata within ServiceNow from a data-driven mechanism and allow them to release those services. And I'll give you an example of that. If you think about a company like Wayfair, which has increased their revenue upwards of 80% in this post-COVID environment, and they did this by taking 1,500 developers that are going through their typical CI/CD process and helping those developers accelerate the delivery of those services through ServiceNow by leveraging our capability to plug that development CI/CD environment and then allow them to do three things. One is data-driven change management. Secondly, once that data is within ServiceNow, then bring together their developers, their SRE teams, and their business planning teams to allow them to then be able to be more efficient and effective in their CI CD process so they can release services much faster to their customers. And so this is a great example of how customers are innovating at digital speed, leveraging ServiceNow. So last but not least, I'll end with the following customer examples of how we're helping customers accelerate and modernize their and automate their service experience. And here's some examples of that. Reduce software, hardware, cloud spend, upwards of 20 to 30% of their IT spend. Make sure they're resilient in their operations. And here's some customer examples of that. And then as I share the Wayfair example, innovate at digital speed. And so how do you accelerate this digital change is with the single platform for IT, bringing all of those IT functions together, bringing all of those people together and allowing them to accelerate their digital workflow across IT in the service of their customers and their experience that they care about. So I wish you the best during this convention and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Zaki. Uh, Zaki, would you mind open your camera for the Q&A? Hey, Zaki, it's good to see you. Zaki, we can't hear you. Let's oh, there you again. go, sorry about that. Okay, it's good to see you. Likewise, how are you? Very good, thank you. I think you already have a few questions. Okay, I missed the questions. Let me take a look at them. I'll start bottom up. So do different assets get synchronized with ServiceNow automatically? Are they discovered or manually connected? Uh, great question. So. We have several ways of ingesting asset information, right? One, certainly from a infrastructure application point of view, whether your whether your assets are running on-prem or in the cloud, we have a way of both pulling the asset data as well as having your cloud vendors push that asset data to us in real time. So that's one aspect is how do we get quick, quote unquote, inventory of your assets, both a push mechanism as well as a pull real-time mechanism. That's number one. Number two, then if you think about software or hardware assets on top of that, and how do we do normalization of those assets, this is where we're leveraging our software asset management, hardware asset management capability to leverage that data against the assets that we've discovered and all the publishers that you may care about, right? Whether they're your SaaS publishers, your 
typical on-prem publishers as well as your cloud publishers that you care about. So the way access gets synchronized is really through that discovery mechanism through our software asset management capability. And then we normalize that against all the publishers that we look against. Should I keep going to the next question? The next one on is ServiceNow customizable? Can I use an API to access the now platform? Certainly. Everything we do within a UI has complete, fully supported APIs underneath from a small microservice function that we offer to a full front end application. All of those can be accessed through an API. And we have a lot of clients that look at their day to day processes and figure out where can I integrate into ServiceNow in those processes and then insert that data into a ServiceNow platform, allowing them to be more efficient and effective. And I gave you that example of just your typical development CICD process, but I can apply that to any business process that cuts across different silos, different functions, different system of records, if you will. And how do I incorporate that into ServiceNow to get that full end-to-end -end view? So you can certainly use the APIs for that. Next question is, can the now platform integrate legacy ERP systems? So what we see with customers is there's sort of five main systems of records that most of our customers have. One on the front end is a CRM system. On the back end is an ERP system to your question. There's a finance system of record. There's a HR system of record. And then there's a more of a collaboration communication system of record. So most companies typically have these five major platforms. And in some cases, as you guys know, there's more than one of each. However, the value, as I said in my talk, that ServiceNow brings to any of these five systems of records is when you need to deliver a employee or a customer outcome, it typically cuts across all of those systems of records. And I'll give you a very simple example, and this is going to answer your, your ERP example. So if you think about us hiring or onboarding a partner, a vendor, or even an employee, what are all the things that we need to do as individuals when we onboard, uh, whether it's a partner of ours, a vendor, or an employee of ours, right? We have to cut across five or six of these different platforms to go make that happen. I was just talking to a major airline, and they, when they onboard a vendor, they have to go through their security department, their finance, their HR, their vendor management, their risk department, the, the uh, resiliency department, right? So there's literally six to eight different departments that they're cutting across on. And yes, one of them is an ERP platform, for all of that order to cash, peer to procure process. So therefore, what we're focused on is really that end customer, employee, vendor, partner experience, and how does it need to be delivered horizontally and integrate into the different systems of records to go deliver that experience. And to answer your question, if one of those systems of records is the ERP system, we are certainly uh, integrating with that for the data that you need for that workflow. I'll, I'll keep going. Uh, how many companies do you service now as their IT software asset management platform? What industries are these companies in? So we have over 800 companies, and these are typically Fortune, you know, two to 3,000 type companies, big size companies that are using certainly our software asset management solution um, that we've consistently uh, accelerated the roadmap on and built the capability on. And this span the industry, certainly finance, highly regulated, highly compliance industry. They're using us to think about finance, think about legal, think about pharma, um, all the way to, you know, even some cloud native companies are using us because they need to understand cost savings is top of mind. Everyone's looking at not just their software asset management spend, but we also have hardware asset management capability. So as companies are thinking about 
depreciation and moving to cloud and how do I look at my hardware assets and look at the full life cycle of those assets, right? We have a lot of telcos looking at our, our, our and using our solution because the whole life cycle asset management component is key for them. And then even think about what we call uh, cloud spend and reducing cloud spend. So this is a notion of, as you have different lines of businesses and distributed teams using software, how do you co collate that understanding of all of that spend from a distributed line of business point of view, bring that together, and then be able to uh, normalize that to give you the outcomes you want from a cost savings point of view. And that's applicable to practically every industry, right? Every industry has distributed teams working and spending funds on software. And so we're helping most of those industries today. So like I said, about six to 800 clients total spanning a lot of our major industries that are out there. Yes, Yuki, do you want to say something? Just one last question, okay? Sure. You want to read? Uh, last one. Can you monitor MS Office licenses usage and Adobe Creative Cloud? Uh, short answer, yes, both in terms of on-prem as well as O365 or Adobe Cloud in a SaaS model. So again, we have a bunch of SaaS vendors that we can monitor, track, use, and give you the full lifecycle asset management of. We certainly have the traditional data center vendors, Oracle, Microsoft, and, and, and SAP and the like. And then we also help you monitor and track a lot of the cloud components and those distributed services within cloud as well, right? So all three of those are what, what we do today. Okay, great. Zaki, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for your time. Please stay with us for the next session. I would like to invite Chaim Lederman, OpenLM VP Sales, to host the panel of discussion. You're welcome to ask our professionals any question you like and do so by using the tab in the right side of your screen. I know there were a few more questions for Zaki, and I hope we'll be able to hope to address them during the discussion now. Chaim? Chaim, please open your camera so we'll be able to see you. Chaim, you're muted. Please unmute yourself. Oh, but you need to un okay, now I'm unmuted. Good Welcome. evening, everyone. Yeah, I'm here. Good. Uh, as he say, as uh, Noah said, my name is Chaim Letterman. I'm VP Sales and Support for OpenLM, and I'll be managing this panel in which we, you know, we would like to uh, go less formal and ask more specific questions that were raised. And I'll start with you, Zaki. And the question is, to what extent is digital change in general and the ServiceNow solution in particular applicable and valuable for small and medium organizations? Because there is this myth that ServiceNow is good for the big guys. Yeah, great, great okay. question. I, I would say, even the big guys, the way they're accelerating their digital transformation with ServiceNow is really focused on what I call one experience, one service, one application mindset, right? So think about if you're a small company and you need to accelerate, let's just take, I'm in New York City, so I deal with a lot of uh, hedge funds that don't have a lot of employees, have a lot of assets that they manage, but they don't have a lot of employees. So by, by the size of employee, they're fairly small. However, what they care about is that experience to that end user or that end customer that they want to really digitize and accelerate. So what we're helping both small and large companies do is really focus on that one experience, one service, one application mindset and go and deliver that quickly. And it doesn't matter if you're a small company or a big company, you can still do that with that mindset, right? And so that's probably my answer to you on that one is like focus on the experience, the outcome, the service, 
and that you care about for the persona at hand. And whether you're a small or a big company, we can help you. Okay. Uh, Jason Olsen from Baker Hughes, could you just present yourself because we did not hear your session yet? And then I can ask you a question. Sure. Um, yes, I'm Jason Olson. I'm with uh, Baker Hughes. I'm in our digital technology group. So um, we kind of renamed IT to be DT in our business and uh, been overseeing uh, deployment of licensed uh, servers and services across our enterprise. Uh, my presentation is coming up after this uh, panel discussion, so we can get into those details and questions around that as well once uh, that presentation is completed. Yes, but I would still start to ask you a question that is applicable to everyone that is looking to implement SAM. And the, what were the resources that you required to achieve your implementation? Right. So, so for us, um, we're still in flight, and it's um, I'm gonna call it a significant uh, deployment. We're looking mm -hmm. at uh, quite a few licensed services to be monitored, and it's really just uh, myself and one other person. We've been uh, working on um, getting licenses uh, moved from the existing host, so they already are deployed currently. So, moving um, assets around, um, getting infrastructure in place, virtual machines set up, um, addressing the the whole security and the network firewalls and those sorts of details working with the, the various uh, software vendors, publishers to get uh, new license files, rehosting those license files, then uh, contacting users to notify them the, of the new license passed and uh, move them over to the new licenses. So it's been a, a pretty uh, active period, I guess we'll call it. And, uh, and as, as you'll see in my uh, presentation that comes up, we have some kind of unique challenges with our business. We're merging two different companies together and they have different architecture and different strategies. So we are kind of running a dual kind of approach to this. We have to kind of do both sides as we eventually become one harmonized uh, business. Thank you. Branislav, you had a brilliant presentation, but what you didn't tell us is what were the actual difficulties you were facing trying to integrate three systems into one and live So how did you convince them to pay for three systems and what's the advantage? How? Thank you. And uh, that, that's a really great question. So how did we convince them? Uh, you need to understand that we are we are a huge corporation and we are with each system. We are targeting something different internally. Uh, how okay. did I convince our company to go with OpenLM? Because I can I can elaborate on that because that was entirely under my jurisdiction. And the, mm -hmm. the, the main two points that helped me was uh, the scope that OpenLM actually covers all the different license managers plus the cost which uh, compared to the solution that used previously which I'm not going to name here was mm -hmm. uh, substantially lower and uh, so how how do these how do these systems work together so uh, uh, we use one core system which you know from Zaki's company, we use service now for for our hardware asset management solution, for our ITSM, uh, for our application deployment. We use Flexera, Flex the solution for our software asset management, which are, uh, as you can imagine, integrated on the back end, so the data is flowing from service now to Flexera. And we use OpenLM uh, strictly for the engineering, uh, which we, by the way, plan to expand uh, to cover our cloud applications as well. But uh, we, as you know, have been having some difficulties with uh, in distributing the OpenLM agents due to the regulation policies within specifically the uh, European region. Uh, I'm talking about GDPR now. But uh, we don't see ourselves, at least not yet, in being able to use just one solution. And that's specifically, and this is how I actually argued the implementation of OpenLM, because the, at the beginning, the management did not completely understand why cannot we use our software asset management tool to monitor the engineering licenses, which is both what Oren elaborated at the beginning and which I also elaborated in my presentation. The, the, technical, the technical implementation of the engineering software portfolio is different. Uh, and as you said, Oren, at the beginning, and I really liked that sentence, it's uh, very much criminally underlooked in many companies. So OpenLM has been a great help here for us. Thank you. Uh, one for René and Michael, uh, which is basically connected to our life today. How does working from home affect the users, 
the need for a tool to manage licenses and the total situation in license management. Michael, one of you, Michael, Rene, anyone? We can't hear you. Yeah. I'm still on mute the microphone, so. <laughs> okay, that's good. Yeah. I don't think there is any differences be between before COVID-19 and nowadays. The, 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 the amount of use, well, the, 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 the draws, what would you say, the take and ends, the, the ones who are using AutoCAD are still using AutoCAD, and the ones who are still using SE are still using SE. And I don't think there is a uh, minimum of, of usage now. So no, the, I'll, tell you, I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you why I'm asking, because some of our customers say, well, everybody's working now from home. I don't know what's happening with the licenses. I can't control them anymore. So, you know, I might as well leave it. Oh, see? No, we're monitoring the licenses nowadays from home. And we see still somebody is using 100 persons in a day uh, are using AutoCAD. So the, the, the usage is uh, mm -hmm. almost the same as we working from home. Thank you. Anyone else wants to make a comment about working from home affecting? Yeah, I, oh, I, I have what? a question. Um, yeah. It's interesting, how, how did you, I understand that uh, your users are currently working from home and still consuming the engineering licenses. So how did you implement it? Do, do they access a virtual workstation by VPN or did you just open the license server port for them to access from home? We we have the we have the, the the heavy applications like the Autodesk and the Arcgis applications we have in a Citrix environment. So for our users, there's there is no difference. The only thing we have we have some some applications are so heavy we need some fat clients. So we need a workstation, and the location where the workstations are is closed. So now we have a. a alternative location where we where we are putting about 15 or 20 fat clients so some people uh, um, who cannot work in the Citrix environment because they need a, a, a lot of CPU and graphical uh, 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 power uh, they can go to that location and do their work but for our the most of our users this changes nothing because every every user goes into a Citrix environment, so the license users, there's no difference in that. Yeah, thank you. Oh, and I have one for you. The end user, okay. the engineer, the engineer, the end user that we in OpenLM uh, are so particular about, and we believe that he has a great role in license management, both now and in future. Can you elaborate on it? Yes, um, actually from the beginning when we started, we viewed the end user, the engineer, as our direct customer. Um, unlike most of the companies in, in our arena. So we, uh, we really thought that uh, the end user is, a, is a, a very important factor. And if you want to achieve good results, good utilization of your licenses, you must bring him into the, the question, uh, equation and also recruit him to the airport. So until um, recently, we, uh, we focused on bringing the information to, to, the, end, to the engineer. So um, allow him to view um, the license utilization, see who is using the licenses he might want to consume. Um, in case he gets license denial, uh, then we, we, he, he doesn't have to go and look for the license. He can just lean back, do something else, and we will notify him when the license becomes available. Um, we are closing idle sessions for people and allowing other people to use, uh, utilize the same licenses and so on. We did a lot. Um, 
But I think that until now, all this was, uh, I would call, technical definition. Okay, you need the data, we'll bring it to you, we'll help you. Uh, we are now, recently we started to look on more on the more soft, soft capabilities. So how do you influence the user to be more uh, friendly uh, or to be to better utilize the licenses and to view this as an important organizational resource that he should be caring about. So we we actually look into different ways to influ influence the, the user. So the first one is, is grading. So um, scaling users by how they use the licenses. So we can we can look and, and say, okay, you consume the license for eight hours. How much time out of that did you actually use used it? Um, and this is one parameter we can we can grade. We can give a grade, and we can give you feedback. And this is the second element. So uh, we we see your activity, we give you a grade, and we give you feedback. So at the end of the day, you can get a green OpenLM icon, and you can get a red one, you can get an orange one, and it gives you a feedback. And we can also show you how you are compared to other users. So that's, that's one way, and this is like rather soft, so it's yours, only you see that. And uh, we are trying to shape your behavior using these uh, organizational resources. Uh, we didn't do that, but we can go further and grant you for your behavior. So if you are uh, handling it better as an organizational resource, we can give you quicker access, better access. And if you're not, we can say, okay, you, you are in the end of the line. And you don't get it so fast. This is something we we are not sure if if this can work. We need to work with, with our users and consult with them if this is something that we should do. Uh, another thing um, on the same line is like providing feedback is very important. So daily reports, uh, but not reports about everyone. Reports about myself. What have I consumed? Um, did I get what I requested? On what rate? How did I use it? And then I get a weekly report. And I think all these efforts can really shape the behavior of, of the user and bring a, a significant change in the utilization of the whole organization. Okay, thank you. Zaki, I want to bring you in on the bigger picture. Uh, it's definitely known now that SAM is the most growing, fastest growing software in the market because it didn't start a long time ago and it's growing. And we are fortunate to have a, a partnership with ServiceNow. Uh, my question to you is how do you view the progress of uh, SAM, you know, ServiceNow, SAM? in the next couple of years, uh, where do you want to get and and how is it going to evolve? Yeah, great question, Chaim. Um, so, you know, we are super excited about the progress that we've seen over the last three years of us having this, this uh, solution. Uh, unfortunately, I can't share details behind the, the results, <laughs> but I can tell you just this weekend, we hit another massive milestone. Let me put it this way. Uh, what it took our service management business to do in 10 years, we've done that with Sam in three years, right? Just to give you an example of where we are. And then for the next five years, our plan and our strategy and, and what we're hearing from our customers and partners and vendors, all the big GSIs, when you think about Accenture and KPMG, et cetera, Deloitte, they're all lining up 100% with where we're going. And if you think about the value of why we do SAM is because the rest of the data that's in the ServiceNow platform allows you to take that asset data, but then put a full lifecycle view around it, right? My cost, my health, 
my availability, my performance, my risk, my vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. my business context, my user context. So that's the power that we're seeing from our customers that are deploying this and leveraging it. Is I can look at my application portfolio, my asset management, my vulnerabilities and risk, manage that entire life cycle. And that's where we see the excitement coming back from our customers. So if you think about that and the expansion of that long term, that is where we see a massive opportunity and we're super excited about where we're going there. Thank you. Have a Ramis question. Ramis one, one more for you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Logan. Go ahead. Yeah, Zaki, I'm interested uh, on average, when you go to um, to new some customers. Uh, do they have an existing solution or you just go in and start everything from scratch because until then they didn't have any? Yeah, I, I would say they certainly have, I would say a probably good 60% have an existing solution. Keep in mind, we're selling to, you know, Fortune, say 5,000 companies, right? So majority of them definitely have an existing solution. However, they're not getting the value out of those solutions. There's a very heavy maintenance management integration to get the value of that solution, right? And then frankly, if you think about SaaS capability and you think about cloud spend capability, a lot of these future modern environments, right? That's where we're also helping customers, right? Like I have a client, a big pharma, in a matter of six weeks, they determined a $8 million overspend on a major SaaS component, that's a CRM vendor. I won't say the name, but a CRM vendor. Another one yeah. used, uh, saved almost 6 million in two months on a major SaaS component, All right? So the point is like, yes, they have the products, they're not getting value, they're not integrated into the rest of the data sets, and therefore they can't get quick value out of those solutions. Right. So it's really that tying the SAM data into a single IT platform and then leveraging that is where they're seeing the value with us. Thank you. Thank you. Branislav, one for you. What is, give me a single thing that you're missing now in your implementation. Is it monitoring? Is it reporting? What, what, what is, if you had to choose one thing, what would you choose? What feature would you say, ah, if I had this one? It would, so would for, it OpenLM, for OpenLM, uh, that would be if we could tie and see the cost of the licenses. The same way that either ServiceNow or Flexera, you know, mm -hmm. are allowing you to implement, implement, import your contracts, import your purchase orders, import the cost of the licenses, and then actually provide an output that's already tied to the cost. If OpenLM had like, that, I, uh, I think I think with the integration with ServiceNow, it might come. Uh, yeah. It's coming. It's not, you know, uh, we, we got to, you know, we got to use Big Brother to to help us with that one. So uh, we are at the best in what we are doing, and they are, you know, much better, much more qualified in what they're doing. And if we combine it together, you'll find that soon enough, uh, this is going to be an existing feature on the ServiceNow dashboard. Yep. So, yep. Uh, so and as you have ServiceNow and you have OpenLM, uh, you will be entitled to use it. So, good, that's a good one. Uh, I have one uh, that I want to share between Zaki and Oren, and I want you both to take a look at the future and try and, 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 and look at two things, and then everyone else can join in. One of them is to take a good look at cloud versus on-premise solution. Where is this world going to? I know everybody says it's going to the cloud, but you know, it's been going for so many years and it didn't get there for some reason. And, uh, and the other thing is, what is the future of licenses? With what is going to happen? Are they all going to be, uh, you know, not lock single use licenses, or are we just going to go back again to floating licenses? What do you think, 
uh, where is this world going to? Oren, you want to start? Yeah, yes, yeah, Zaki dropped, so I, I, I have to yeah. start. Um, yeah, you have. Oh. No, but everybody else can join in, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's a very good uh, question. I, actually, I, I was thinking about that. That's very interesting. And uh, I think we, it starts, uh, so when we consider licensing, we need to start uh, with communication. So every, everything started, starts on networking and infrastructure and communication. As communication gets fa faster, then more functionality is moving from the client application that we, we would typically see. We see Autodesk, we see ANSYS, we see different applications. And it's always traditionally running on the end user workstation. And now it's moving, actually not very slowly, it's moving fastly to the server environment. So as applies for that, we will see more and more licensing moving from client application like we, we see now, desktop application, ArcGIS, AutoCAD, different application, it will move to the server. Uh, now, th this is the real trick now. Um, on the server, what's, what's going to happen? Because currently we see uh, most companies are going for the approach of, let's choose one factor and just stick to it. So they say, Typically, most companies will say, okay, what's, what can we stick to? Users, okay, users is good. We charge this money for, for a user. Ah, I have different offers, so I will charge $10 per user for, for the lowest tier and then 20 for the mid tier and, and so on. So that's what we see today. I, I'm not sure if this is going to continue exactly like that. So um, as as communication is getting faster, and we already have 5G even here, it started, um, it's all, it might go to more like micro actions, send that here, send that there, and we might see some licensing switching from the user model more to a model that actually measure uh, things done and uh, and what, what do you pay for that? And then it's more like a token licenses than licensing than what we we see today. Zaki, Zaki you, you any might... Comment, any com yeah, any yeah, comment I, on... Uh, so, so Chai, I think the question is valid, right? We've, we've talked about this cloud transformation happening for 10 years now, and it's still coming and coming. However, I will say post COVID, the acceleration to cloud has been 10 to 20x, right? There was a JPMC report re released recently that said, you know, Azure, Amazon, and then it had ServiceNow as number three were the top three investment areas that they interviewed 150 CEOs that, that they were investing in. So the point is cloud acceleration, I think is here now, is happening. Companies realize they need to move fast and the only way they can move fast to deliver those services is in cloud. So I think you're gonna see acceleration there. Now, how does that impact licensing? I still see, so most of my clients are telling me, hey, 40 to 50% of our applications are gonna to go to SaaS. So I think SaaS license spend is gonna increase and in managing that and the full life cycle around that, especially from a user consumption, user usage point of view is critical. So I think that's one change we have to get in front of if we're now ready there. The second is, I do think this work from anywhere, work remotely, dispersed working environment is gonna allow us to really look at, how do I look at consumption at the local level, right? So not at a centralized level, at a local level, which is slightly different than what Oren, you're saying, right? I do think that dispersed employee base is gonna force us to look at ways on quickly capturing that dispersed uh, license, both hardware, software, like I have a client that distributed 30,000 laptops in this post COVID environment across the world. How do you do life cycle management around those assets, right? So I don't think that's going away. And then the third one is your, your on-prem Oracle, SAP, Microsoft spend 
which we know has a lot of you know compliance and uh, licensing requirements there. I don't think they're going away that quickly and customers really want to get visibility and insight into those as well, right? So I would say these are the three trends, at least the first two are what we're seeing accelerating right now, SaaS and end user spend. Jason, what do you feel, what do you see in BH now out of these two? Um, right, so it's really tough. I see a lot of going towards that subscription model um, you know, the permanent license uh, strategy, I think a lot of companies are trying to move away from that, you know, whether it be the tokens going away. And so, you know, obviously that's not in our interest. So we would prefer that not to happen. But uh, as we see that, um, and as, as far as the cloud, we, we definitely see a lot of cloud activity. That's uh, very, very popular for our business. We did have licenses in cloud. Our current strategy right now is to have them on-prem. Um, in part, we have a few things um, going on at once, so we're trying to reduce the number of moving parts. So we'll do that in the short term. The longer term, I expect uh, we'll end up being in the cloud for our licensed services um, longer term. Branislav, any comment on that? Well, don't you think it's funny that we are basically finishing the circle when back you, in the 80s, you had those terminals and everything was running so to speak, on mm -hmm. cloud, on those huge computers in those mm -hmm. areas, in the, in, the, in the factories. We moved to when everything mm -hmm. was running on-prem and you had power because the computers became powerful enough so they were able to run the software themselves. And now we are moving back to the, the situation where the end user will simply have a simple a machine with a monitor and a keyboard and a mouse and all the processing will be again done at the server level in cloud but yes yeah. i can i can only agree that uh the trend the trend is there and uh i believe it will only increase well i personally believe that yes we will move to the cloud but in terms of licensing uh, i've seen it happening during my lifetime you know i've received a plug which i put in a computer for autodesk and when they discovered you know where they were pushed around there was the invention of a floating license and when they decide now they want to make more money they are going back to the plug okay it doesn't matter if it's going to be a cloud license or, or non-prem license but it really depends on the customers if the customers push them enough yes they will go back and offer a shared cloud license for users they'll find the, the, the formula but definitely we are we can see the move to the cloud and there's very little we can do about it. We don't want to do anything about it. Okay, guys, any additional comments? I think... Hi, I wanted to yeah. comment on, uh, on cloud versus on-prem adoption. So Go ahead. We Please. are still uh, serving many companies that need a closed network. So, uh, like many customers of us, they have a closed environment because of security reasons, and it's not a single uh, closed environment. They have multiple closed environment within the same company, and uh, it's very complex to manage this environment, and this is not going to disappear uh, in m many years forward so we will still need to support these companies and vendor uh, vendors also understand that and uh, mm -hmm. just an example uh, take autodesk for example they came up with this new subscription based licenses which i completely understand why they are doing that uh, but uh, they still kept an offering for uh, network licenses, which they now call token flex licenses, licensing, uh, which is very smart. I like it actually. Uh, but they always keep something on the side. Okay, if this customer insists and is not going to agree to us, then okay, we have something to to offer. So I hope it will still be offered to customers. Okay, let me see if we have any more questions. No, I don't. No, I will uh, soon invite the security to throw me from the stage. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. They're going to need to throw you out. Well, 
I can't, I can't see any more questions in the box at the moment. And uh, okay, is uh, I've got here. No, then we've seen it, the API to access now platform. That's an old one. Anyway, I, I can't see any more questions and I don't want to waste any questions on Jason because he still needs to do his presentation and he probably responds to uh, most of them. So I think we can ask uh, Noah to, to close the session. <laughs> yeah, time. We had a few more questions. There are the question top directed to you that we had before for Zaki. So we forwarded a. I think mm -hmm. you can find them in the question tab. Well, I, I've looked at my uh, panel here and I can't see any. Ah, the questions from the previous, uh, you mean? Um, yeah, there were a few there. You can't yeah, see them? The one with the eight. I think they're okay. I think I think we've yeah, we we answered we, those already. We, yeah, we answered okay. them. We answered. Them. So we can okay. conclude. Yeah, we've got beauty before age, and we will rest. Wonderful. Then thank you very much, everyone, for your thank participation. You. Thank you. We're going now for a ten minutes break. Right after the break, we have Jason Olson from Baker Hughes. Give him a presentation, so don't miss. Stay with us. Thank you. We will stay. Thank you, Hein. Thank you. Let's see. Go.
Thank you for joining back. Our next presenter is Jason Olson, Senior Staff Enterprise Application Engineer in Baker Hughes. Baker Hughes in is, is an energy technology company with operations in over 120 countries. Jason will share his experience of how a middle-sized company merged into an enterprise such as Baker Hughes. He will share his best practice of how to assist the company in such a transition. Jason, the stage is yours. Hello, I'm Jason Olson from Baker Hughes Digital Technology Team. I, with my peers, are responsible for managing engineering and other technical software, annual software renewals, licenses, licensed services, and servers. I'd like to take you through our journey as we expand our license pools and infrastructure across Baker Hughes. We will cover several aspects of our journey. Perhaps some will be similar to what you have experienced or will experience. Topics cover are an overview of Baker Hughes, engineering software deployment, engineering software monitoring, monitoring tool selection, deployment strategy, current landscape, and ANSYS use case where we demonstrate value, our next steps followed by questions and answers. Baker Hughes is a large organization in the energy sector with over 80,000 employees and contractors. Formerly, we were Baker Hughes International Inc, BHI, and General Electric Oil and Gas, GEOG, which merged into Baker Hughes, a GE company, or BHGE, in July 2017. Baker Hughes, a GE company, was independent from General Electric, even trading on its own stock symbol, BHGE. With GE as a majority shareholder at five-eighths of, of all stock, we enjoyed some special benefits that are not available should ownership drop below 50%. Our relationship gave us access to GE's impressive buying power, IT infrastructure, new technologies, business processes, and overall global strength. The two legacy businesses began to integrate into one business, including HR and IT platforms. This was a significant shift as very little between the two organizations were done in the same way. Either way is fine, but together there is a conflict and things quickly became very difficult. The GE underlying infrastructure was going to become the standard for BHGE. This includes PCs, servers, networks, identity management, and HR systems. The challenges we were facing were significant. Almost every time there are two typical options to solve an answer for a business need, legacy BHI had deployed a different strategy than GEs. It's similar to right-hand drive cars versus left-hand drive cars. They both, both work just fine, but driving right-handed cars on right-hand side of the road is less natural than on the left. Some of the key aspects that the two legacy organizations differed include general control of how users access and engage digital, digital systems. Legacy Baker Hughes limited what an individual can do, um, opting for requests and permissions to have something done to the infrastructure or systems. This includes extensive use of help desk tickets to get things done. Who and how different users and hardware access, access networks from very limited to and managed to more of a high level access request granted and reliance on individual software pools to limit use. Users of physical data centers versus ag aggressive approach to use cloud-based infrastructure. Cost capturing and budgeting is another area of great difference. This remains a challenge as slowly budgets from various organizations are harmonized to be aligned to one way of capturing the needs. GE always intended to reduce its ownership of BHGE from its 62.5% to something less. However, what wasn't clear was the timing of the divestiture and pace of sell down. In late 2018, GE was experiencing some financial and cash flow pressure. This may have accelerated GE's timetable for divesting in BHGE. Late in 2019, GE's ownership dropped to less than 
sparking off VHGE separation from GE, including civil mandatory actions such as separation of HR and financial systems. Baker Hughes, a GE company, became Baker Hughes. We entered separation from GE. This is a massive undertaking and will take several years. Different timetables exist depending on services, applications, or agreement. Each has its own parameters and contractual impacts. Having only recently gone through the exercise of integrating Baker Hughes International with GE Oil and Gas in a previous year and a half, we had a decent understanding of what it will take to separate from GE. Some strategies, such as harmonizing on GE's standards, were reevaluated and many times pivoted to a new strategy. More often than not, the old strategy of aligning with GE's approach was abandoned, and what Legacy PHI had done would be adopted as a new way of doing things. The work ahead of us is significant, yet exciting to define how we want our company to look like and how we will do it. The two legacy organizations had different approaches to how software is provisioned and deployed to the user's PC. Legacy BHI required permissions to secure software, and the software typically was pushed onto a PC using SCCM software packages. Legacy GE Oil and Gas enabled users to self-install software. This includes um, shareware tools, applications purchased under local POs, as well as through workflows like the MyTech portal. Capturing costs and applying the, an asset back to a sub-business was common practice for GE Oil and Gas, but not for Legacy Baker Hughes International. What processes a user follows is dependent upon the computer hardware, the base image of the PC, either Legacy Baker Hughes International non-admin rights or Legacy GE with admin rights. This is confusing for those who have more than one PC and need to follow both business processes if they have a PC from each legacy organization. We seek to quantify demand for software tools. This includes understanding who is using the tools, where they're located, when they access the tools, and for how long. Having two legacy systems continues to add complexity as there are two active directories and not all user IDs or Windows login IDs are captured in both tools. This impacts enriching usage data, including adding in geographic and business parameters. Usage data aggregation across all networks and systems can be difficult and tool, when tools are used or key software pools do not have data captured. Through aggregation of data, we seek to reduce administrative costs by optimizing pool size as well as a number of pools offered. This includes site, region versus global licensing pools. With geographic and business data tagging, renewals and cost sharing can be applied. Divestitures and acquisitions are common for our organization. Understanding the impact to existing pools and capacity should assets be released with a divested business or need to absorb a new demand from an acquisition. Actively managing software is something that has been somewhat inconsistently deployed across the two legacy businesses. Access control often is left to how software is installed and configured, so a more of a passive strategy as opposed to blocking unauthorized users or checking for non-compliant use. Releasing hung sessions, as well as identifying what sessions or users are idle, typically was done manually, if at all. Very little is done proactively encourage use of preferred tools and discourage non-preferred tools. We have a lot of engineering and technical software packages. Many individual pools from legacy businesses, as well as pools that were managed and administered by other GE businesses. The Legacy Baker Hughes International Organization used Altera's Software Asset Optimization, SAO, to help understand who was using what assets, for how long, etc. There were well over 6,000 users covered by the SAO tool. 
prior to SAO, Legacy Baker Hughes International used Flexera as FlexNet Manager for Engineering Applications. The Legacy Oil and Gas business had a 500 user count deployment of OpenLM. This was managing SolidWorks users within a large business group to enable cost sharing or build back across the various sub-businesses. The business was able to reduce SolidWorks renewal costs by $120,000 through combining and reducing the total number of assets managed into three large pools as opposed to many smaller pools. Most of GE oil and gas did not have formal tools to help manage assets or usage. It was more of a local IT team's knowledge as they managed the software license pools. Through separation from GE, a team was assembled to address the software provisioning, access, compliance, and monitoring. The software governance team performed their analysis of potential solutions and integrations to existing tools, such as configuration management database systems, and Flexera was a platform of choice with FlexNet Manager Suite, or FNMS. However, not automatic, automatically included by Flexera was the FlexNet Manager for Engineering Applications. The team was down the path of securing Flexera's engineering module. However, based upon legacy Baker Hughes International's experience with Flexera's engineering module and legacy GE oil and gas experience with OpenLM, the topic, the topic was reopened for evaluation. Ultimately, OpenLM proved out to be the better choice based on features, price, and history of customer support. We opted for the following from OpenLM. License Allocation Manager, Vendor Daemons. Initially, 80 of those were purchased, but recently expanded to 260. 15,000 users and 15,000 active agents. Reporting Hub, Roles and Permissions, Directory Synchronization, Group Usage, Project Usage, and Alerts. Our plan, still in execution, is to have all licensed services monitored with OpenLM and as many as we can be hosted in our licensed server farm. The server farm consists of 45 identically designed and configured virtual machines in North America, Europe, and Asia. We are looking to capture usage per user and associate it with the user's business unit and location to enable cost sharing or build back or similar financial cost assessments to cover the costs of software renewal and expansions. Drive compliance through understanding who is using what and when and where. Capture software usage associated with specific projects, customer orders, or similar where projects are quoted as a cost plus. Automate licensed service restarts and automate notification of services going down. Have a dedicated 24-7 support team to ensure licensed services remain operational and available to the user community. Dedicated team to update license files, ensure server OS is up to date and complete most internal administrative tasks. Historically, this was done by each license pool owner and there were many owners. Automate the release of idle software sessions. Perform an analytics to determine pool write size using OpenLM native reports as well as enhance analytics through Power BI desktop or other data analytic tools and address denials of service. Currently, we have consumed 66 vendor daemons and average 8,800 unique users per month and are monitoring over 100 licensed services. Users continue to be added to our monitoring as license pools from GE are moved to Baker Hughes' landscape, and existing Baker Hughes pools are brought under monitoring. We have significant pools for Altair, ANSYS, Asmintech, Autodesk, SolidWorks, MathWorks, National Instruments, PTC, Siemens, and many other smaller packages. We anticipate having well over 200 licensed services to monitor, several triads deployed, a broad range of licensing technologies, FlexLM, HAS, RMS, 
and licensing pool strategies, concurrence, token, named user, site, and regional global um, license pools, and so on. ANSYS software licensing is very complex, as there are over 200 products with more than 300 different features. Just like a Swiss Army knife, some products have many tools or features in the case for ANSYS. However, only one tool or feature can be used from the product bundle at any time. The product bundles vary greatly in price. Some may have many tools. This gives great versatility, but at a higher cost of ownership. This frequently is beneficial for smaller organizations that need variety uh, of more, than, more so than overall capacity. As you can see from the graphics, some of these knives shown have common features, while others have new features not available in the other product or previous knife. Just like holding a knife, you can only operate one tool at a time and only one person can hold the knife. If a saw blade is needed, there are only two knives available. One is a more expensive version with many other tools. Should a tool only um, be available in the full featured knife be required, say the can opener, you will have to wait for the full featured knife or product to become available. This is an example of how our complexity of the ANSYS landscape, We're trying to use this with the Swiss Army Life visual. On the GE's ANSYS pool, there was seemingly limitless capacity based upon specific GE ANSYS agreement and deployment model. Users enjoyed having what they wanted when they wanted it. GE had a very long relationship with ANSYS, even co-developing and improving many of the ANSYS products. Some packages in the GE portfolio have been grandfathered in to their offering and not available for new purchases. This made mapping GE's usage data to our needs very difficult. GE had a special relationship for surge in demand capacities, and this also was not available to Baker Hughes under our new Baker Hughes G ANSYS agreement. Determining the right size of the pool can be simply impacted based upon the different kinds of demands that we see throughout the year. GE oil and gas business had developed many designs and analysis automations that call up ANSYS routines. This can cause sharp peaks in demand due to the rapid series of calculations getting initiated. Use of Cray and other high performance computing resources enables a lot of work to be processed rapidly, as well as quickly consuming licenses, again, causing us spikes in demand. Early in the separation process, Baker Hughes stood up its own ANSYS pool. This deployment would have would prove to be one of our most challenging pools deployed. Fortunately, we had recently deployed OpenLM and were monitoring ANSYS pool. Very early on, we experienced significant denials of service. This would break the many automations and routines um, called up features and packages. We also had situations where these autom automations were referring to old ANSYS packages and package names that were not available. This again, breaking our automations. The ANSYS user community was very anxious and people began to hoard licenses, not releasing them back to the pool at the end of the day. This further stressed an already fragile ecosystem. We needed to identify where to focus our attention and using OpenLM was crucial in this activity. Focused, followed by monitoring, then implementing controls and behavior modification helped to quantify the problem. We then could purchase the gap between the current capacity and our reasonable likely capacity required. To gain focus, we use OpenLM's native reports, first being the feature usage summary. This provided a means of quantifying what features we were, were in use at the moment and helped to guide us as to what else should be evaluated. The evaluation included contract, contacting users to understand if they could use other features that were not in such high demand or see if they could schedule jobs to another off-peak 
off peak period. The quality of service report offers a clean and simple means of understanding how many seats we are using to ensure a specific level of availability. What is less obvious is how different quality of service levels actually feel or how broad of an impact it has on the user base. Other than the obvious 100% or 99 plus percent quality of service is good from the user's point of view, it is less clear, clear what the business impact would be at a lower quality of service level, such as 95%, 90%, or perhaps even lower. Shortcoming of the quality of service became evident as there was no insights when demand exceeded capacity. Also, it treats all hours and days of the week equally. Having significant operations in Europe and North America, there are definite higher demand times of the day as those two time zones overlap. However, simply excluding the demand of regions outside of Europe and North America might lead to overlooking other key usage patterns. The Den denials of service um, provided to be another difficult report to fully understand, as it appeared to overstate the rate of denials. As can be seen by the chart, one user shows a huge number of denials. This might be more of a means of identifying potential squeaky wheels. Those who will likely complain about a denial as they keep see, seeking a seat even when recently having been not denied. These are great reasons why having active agents deployed can offer a better user experience and productivity. Being put on a waiting list enables a user to work on other tasks without having to repeatedly check for availability of a denied license. Using Power BI Desktop with a reporting hub SQL database, we could better visualize the problem by looking at unique user IDs for denials. The orange bars show how many denials of the feature happened. The number of adjacent lines indicates duration of denials and when they occurred, each line width being one hour of a day. The black line is what we have for overall feature capacity. However, this is misleading as the feature can be in many different packages, and as soon as a package is serving another feature, the resulting capacity is reduced. This is represented by the orange lines that fall below the horizontal black line. We could visualize and look um, to be the typical number of denials and give consideration to length of denial. We can approximate what additional capacity is needed to satisfy the typical demand. OpenLM has a native heat map view. This provides a quick means of visually capturing peak usage periods. However, there are downsides as a heat map is relative to the pool entitlement size. For our scenario, we had a temporary limitless pool um, to determine our ceiling, but everything looks green during that period. Initially, you see in red where we have denials, then in the dark green where we had a rapidly expanded pool capacity, and then we throttled back the pool size, as you can see in the yellows and the orange sections. Using Power BI, a similar but different heat map view is generated. Here, the heat map covers are relative to usage, not capacity. This analysis was conducted across a few specific high demand features, but to simplify the discussion, I'll focus on the product ANSYS Mechanical that has the feature ANSYS. This is an expensive package and we own 79 seats. The data shown is from Power BI, but a similar view is available natively through OpenLM's web interface reports. You see the busiest times are from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. GMT. The busiest days are midweek. And going through some of our key events through our process, as you can see starting at the bottom on May 6, we show only Baker Hughes assets and they're all utilized, 79 used. On May 7th, ANS has provided an additional 25 seats so we could find capacity. 
And as you can see here, that too rapidly increased to be fully consumed to 104 features or our total of population. On May 12th, we had to add an additional 475 seats to give us almost a limitless ceiling in order to understand where our maximum capacity is. And here on May 20th, we see a peak of 155 seats used at one period, perhaps averaging of above the 130 or so, which would be a gap around 50. To close that gap between what we own of 79 to 130 would be about a $2.7 million investment. On May 22nd, we communicated um, to our users about changes in some preferences. Here again is where what Legacy GE had as far as the order of preferences and what we had in our actual pool were different and caused some conflicts where users would access the more expensive preferences first and not get to the lower um, cost preferences second. And these lower cost preferences sometimes had um, reduced capacity or capabilities. We see that um, after the communication, our peak usage is down to 140. And then on June 6, we communicated with the users asking them to release idle, um, idle sessions. And here the usage now is down into the 90 to perhaps 100 range. So we'll call that a gap of around 17, roughly a million dollars or 1.7 million less than what we would have had if we were looking at um, just our peak demand. So I know it's a lot of information to process. Hopefully you can uh, follow through the slide and understand that we do have some great value by understanding our peak demand as well as average demand and how the gap or close the gap between what we currently have and what our average demand typically is. Looking to the future, our next steps, we had um, planned to categorize our different applications, different tiers. With the top tier are being our enterprise contracts, those that are really expensive, thousands of users, multiple sub businesses involved. Often we'll have multi year contracts on those. Mid tier, which um, has a combination of cost, user base, and number of businesses similar to the top tier, but perhaps one of the threshold categories is below the top tier um, classification. And then we have the bottom tier which is the balance of our applications in a majority of what we own. We seek to build a rhythm around understanding usage with the top tier as getting most frequent reviews and very deep analytics at the time of contract renewal. Um, reducing frequency and depth of analytics for mid and then bottom tier is um, perhaps just an annual review. We seek to deploy our active agents across the enterprise to help us release those idle sessions as well as monitor other tools. We will seek to, to monitor the standalone and even non-licensed pool applications. And then we also look to capture project costs so we can bid some projects as a cost plus um, strategy. So I'm looking forward to receiving some questions and uh, we'll go through our questions and answers now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Would you like to open your camera? Oh, great. To answer the questions, yep. do you see the questions? I see you already have a few. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Um, so yes, we have a few questions. Um, so the first one is uh, now that we have experienced two different approaches to managing our IT landscape, uh, one's Baker Hughes and one GE. Um, what's my uh, take about uh, what to keep versus what to uh, to, to close or, or do away with? Well, it's really not my decision, but um, you know, I guess my my preference. Um, Really, it doesn't matter to me too much which one. It's the, the key is that we choose one and have just one way of doing things. Um, having the two methods at the same time isn't really a challenge for us, and that's been really extremely painful. You know, I guess suppose seeing that I'm from the legacy GE side of things, I'm more familiar with the GE side, so that uh, was kind of like I guess we'll call it more natural. But uh, there are benefits, I suppose, uh, going to the Baker side of where uh, you don't have admin rights to your computer. There are a few other things they had uh, historically that put more controls in place, which um, as you start to scale things up, that's um, helpful when you have some more controls. It is going to be a, a definite challenge, a culture shock for those who are used to having like admin rights to not have admin rights, can't install software. But then on the same token, from a business point of view, that's a benefit to our business 
in it, that it reduces our overall risk. Um, so the, the next question is, uh, wanted to talk about the GE approach to manage costs. Um, it's cost centers for IT services. Um, what are our benefits, any downsides? So, um, so yeah, it's it an interesting style of, of addressing the, the costs. Um, Legacy GE did do this build back strategy and treated each uh, of the businesses as their own profit centers and um, required the different groups to budget their expenditures. Whereas on the Legacy Baker side, once again, two choices, either A or B, they chose B when one group chose A. So they did the opposite. So it was all held at headquarters and uh, they didn't do an assessment back uh, to those product companies or sub businesses. I, th I see our future that we'll probably go towards that um, build back strategy, although it's not 100% formalized. Uh, it's a little bit of a mixed model in the short term. I think the, the benefit is that uh, each of the businesses who actually make the money for the company can understand the value of these tools. And if they see that they have a lot of different tools and perhaps aren't driving as much value as would would have uh, liked, they'll make a change and we can look to uh, reduce our overall costs. Um, some of the downsides, I guess, uh, is that uh, everybody to see what to budget. So you get a lot of questions about, well, what's my spend gonna be for the next year? And we don't really necessarily know what their spend's gonna be. In part, we um, base future spend on historical usage. So we take the, the entire renewal cost and um, do a percentage of total usage hours per application and assess that against the product company. So that's how they get their, their part of the bill. Um, right, so a question about uh, implementation of project monitoring. Is it already working? If yes, how do uh, users uh, cooperate uh, with this? Uh, we don't actually have that. As I mentioned at the very end of the presentation, the, the active agents are not deployed currently. So we haven't done that. Uh, we did have a meeting earlier today with the team to do a pilot. So we're looking to uh, get a pilot going to better understand the active agents, the benefits, uh, tracking project usage, either pre-revenue, uh, such as when you're doing quotes, as well as uh, later on when you actually have one in order and then and it can do a cost plus uh, bid for a project. So that's to become uh, an opportunity for us to evaluate. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the ability to release idle sessions. I think to me that's um, the area I'm most uh, excited about, as well as um, driving adoption of uh, preferred tools. So as you can monitor the all the tools and find who's using the non-preferred tools, get an opportunity to reach out to them and, and discuss why they're still using non-preferred tools and encourage the use of preferred tools. So um, a question around the audits. So did any of our engineering vendors come to audit and what was your experience? Well, I haven't experienced that at this point. So I have really nothing to say on that. I've, I've not been part of an audit. Um, I have not even heard anecdotally um, about audits in the past. I'm sure they've been done, but um, I've not been uh, privy to those uh, uh, undertakings. I'm fairly new in this role of uh, call it, uh, license monitoring and, uh, and so forth. So really looking at this for perhaps the last year. Uh, prior to that, uh, it was a little bit of just open LM experience as we had one SolidWorks pool. We're trying to do our cost um, allocation. So that was my experience in the overall license monitoring. So not so much on the, um, the audit side of things, but um, I'll be interested to see how those things uh, pan out in the future. So um, yeah, I talked a lot about the ANSYS and this is a question regarding that. So taking ANSYS as an example, what percentage of usage is on workstations um, versus the, our HPCs, or High Performance Computing Centers? So that's really a great question. I don't have a, a, an exact number for you. Um, I'll just give you a gut feel. So I'd say we're probably, um, I'd imagine maybe 60% on HPCs. It's, I think it's a pretty strong number. We have a lot of automations that um, automatically run from uh, whether you're doing a quoting of jobs or other things and they'll actually call up HPC resources. So I think uh, we have a pretty large number there. We also have a lot of uh, very um, complex calculations being done in the CFD area. So that's also HPC usage. So it's, uh, and that's been kind of causing some challenges as we have uh, a lot of routines kicked off quickly through the automation. So that's a, a common pain point for us. Okay. Um, 
so what is or was the timeline of our transition? And then there was a follow-up about that, uh, asking how many of our full-time equivalents to um, achieve this strategy. So we're looking at uh, probably a couple to three years to, to do our transition from the, the space of GE into our own space. And I hope within that time frame to secure our, our whole license uh, monitoring and hosting strategy within that time frame as well. Our full-time equivalence is a great question because it's um, a little bit of a challenge right now with just two of us. We're doing this um, not even 100% of our time, although it feels like it. Perhaps um, it's, a, it's a pretty large percentage of our time. We do hope to grow that group. So that's uh, something we're working on currently to, to increase that. Uh, so I'd envision that probably more in a, uh, like we say, five or six um, count once we're all said and done, then hopefully. It will comprise of mostly, um, I guess, um, some contracted services. So we'll have a small group that is uh, employees and a larger group that'll be uh, contracted services. So um, how complex and time con conscious was the implements of active agents? So um, how accurate and uh, any prone to errors? Well, we haven't really deployed those agents yet, so I really don't have any data report on that. Um, the next question is also about um, have we deployed apps manager for managing non-steroid licenses? So again, that's where the um, the active agents would help us uh, kind of quantify those non-licensed uh, software packages, standalones, what have you. And uh, we haven't deployed that yet either. So I, I see that as a great opportunity for us to understand. Uh, some products such as uh, MathWorks MATLAB is one where we have uh, a variety of pools as well as standalone packages and understanding who's using what, when and how long is going to be very helpful. So does someone have a standalone, a standalone package that perhaps uh, doesn't use it too much and would be better served uh, giving up that standalone package to somebody who is a heavy user and that person uh, who's a late user go into a, a concurrent pool. And uh, I appreciate the, the remark here. I'm feeling the, the pain on the ANSYS side. I, ANSYS has been um, a real challenge for us, but the company itself has been a great company. I couldn't have asked for better. So as a business, ANSYS has been super, um, but uh, it, it is a challenge. And as one of our engineers uh, said, you increase your capacity, you'll get used up. So you can never have too much capacity. So that's one of our other challenges that uh, the more you do, the more they want. Um, right, so the question here was on, on how many users do we have in the ANSYS um, space? Um, I'd say we're probably in the, around a thousand perhaps users of ANSYS. Some are heavy users uh, and some are light users. So we have a, a wide spread of that, but we have a pretty large uh, user base. Uh, so I'd say about a thousand. Okay, here's a kind of a long question. Um, okay, as a large organization, um, don't talk to do, duplicate spend from a cost perspective, not a security perspective. What is there in place that is inexpensive to give visibility to large organizations? For example, I know software um, houses that offer a, a portal, like a grocery store has a portal, so you know what you've purchased, where, what do you recommend for a large agency with reduced budgets? Um, None numbers are sure if I understand the question um, totally. Yeah, I, I, I think if you're really just looking to understand um, who's using what, and so forth, getting a, something like a OpenLM or something that will track your usage helpful to understand where the usage is going and, and how to support your user base. Uh, some uh, products come along with their own uh, license uh, track information. You can query that as well. So we're, we're in the process of uh, standing up our Autodesk pool and their Autodesk also has some features to help with standing the pools um, I won't be using that because we'd like to keep it all into one uh, reporting tool, so we won't, won't take advantage of that, but that would be a, an option for someone, I suppose. Uh, 
uh, regarding budget spend, um, is that driven by user community um, for your applications? So it's um, it's it's based upon usage. So it the we we ask uh, the different user um, organizations to allocate funding based on percent of total usage. And if we find that our pools are greatly oversized, that we would actually reduce the pool at the next opportunity to reduce the overall spend. Likewise, if we find we um, have a lot of denials of service, such as at Hans's example, we would um, do a cost share across those businesses as we expand those pools. So again, it's based off of actual usage. And here is where it'll be an advantage to those who have active agents deployed to release those idle sessions because then it will reduce the cost of their, their own um, home business. Everything is driven really off of your product company, and if their um, profitability is, is higher, such as uh, reducing your license spend, that's uh, in their best interest. So what do you think is the best practice to determine how many licenses you need if you're running out of licenses? Vendors are often unwilling to grant the period of free additional licenses to measure actual licensing needs and buying too many licenses is costly. Absolutely, I agree, agree 100%. And that is, as I mentioned earlier, ANSYS was a, a great partner for us. They did give us access to, as I'll call it, that limitless pool. Um, it was a couple other products, uh, features that they had that we were also kind of getting pinched on. And they did expand those pools on a temporary basis so we could find where that limit is. It is really tough if you didn't have that ability to do that to anticipate what your true true needs really are. Um, that's where we saw with the Power BI and the, those denials report and those orange lines. That was one way to kind of help help us visualize uh, what perhaps our future state should be. Uh, so that'd be one way to kind of get there from here. Um, the other option really is uh, to slowly increase those pools, but that um, logistically can be really painful you know, for our side, cutting POs is often a lengthy process, goes through the cycle. So if you wanted to increase it a little bit one week and then again a little bit more the next week, um, that would not be something I'd wanted to entertain too many times because it would be really, really tough. So I, I can feel your pain on that. I don't really have a good solution. And uh, I'd be interested to know if we have any other ways of doing predictive um, demand, but that would be something of, of interest to me. Okay, um, I think this may be more of a comment. So it says audit, um, huge fights reporting hub can help to monitor compliance cases. So so yes, we we do have the um, the reporting hub and that is gonna help us a whole lot to uh, keep track of, of our usage. So a question regarding Autodesk, did you hear that anyone received extra territorial rates from Autodesk without Premier support. Um, I, I don't know about that. I, I, I'm not familiar with um, that aspect. Uh, we we have uh, an enterprise agreement that we're working on. It's not yet finalized. And uh, we'll have three pools, one that's going to be hosted in the Asia time zone, one in the European time zone, and one in the Americas time zone. And that's just because of Autodesk's um, token usage, it's a, it's based on the server time. So it's a token day of a server and their tokens uh, basically expire end of the day. And if you still have it at the, just after midnight, you get charged essentially another full token day. So their tokens are a full day usage um, or portion of a day if you don't use a full day. So um, how do I map um, account names to cost centers? So this um, is a little bit of a painful process. Um, but essentially I have the user's IDs, which is their Windows login, often, but not always, that aligns to their, um, I guess we'll call it Active Directory um, information. And there is a another portal that I have access to that can link um, these Active Directory record IDs to geographic as well as uh, business units. Uh, so I use that to, to determine which uh, group they're within. So uh, I think I'm probably getting close to the end of my time. So uh, <laughs> yes, I don't want to interrupt because there are so many questions. But can you choose like uh, one last question to answer? Um, 
Okay, so here's something we're working on right now. It says, uh, can you expand on the benefits of Power BI for OpenLM and, um, that I experienced and was it easy to implement? So uh, we found it very useful and the benefits are really huge. I think you can really look at data in a lot of additional ways. Um, I've been heavy into Excel, so that's been my kind of go-to tool. It still is for so many things. And, uh, and I was kind of new to this whole idea of the data analytics and the Power BI desktop was really helpful to that. It was uh, fairly easy to, uh, to deploy, so that wasn't a problem. Our current problem is that our, our amount of data we've captured has overwhelmed it, and we can't use the, the Power BI desktop just because our data set is so large, we can't consume it. And I, I think we're, we're tracking it in. It's actually our named user license pool that is causing this problem because it, it tracks the usage as well as the non-usage, so you get reports on um, a data on both. So I think it's like, I don't know, 90 plus percent of our data is just from one particular licensed service. So that's uh, kind of blown up our pool, even though we have you know, 100 services running, one has really kind of overwhelmed everything else. Jason, that was incredible. Thank you very much. I'm sure many of our participants learned a lot and they have many more questions. So guys, if you have more questions, please email us and we'll ask, I don't know, maybe not Jason, but one of our support guys will definitely give you the answer. Thank you again. I have a great pleasure to invite Oren Gabay, OpenLM co-founder and CEO, to share his insights into the challenges we met today. Oren? Thank you. Hello. Uh, so that was an incredible evening, and I really enjoyed it. And I would like first to thank OpenLM team, led by Noah. Thanks you for your effort and thank you for making it possible. Many people worked on that, so we thank everyone. I would also like to thank our partners and customers for sharing their stories. Zaki Bajwa from ServiceNow, uh, Jason from Baker Hooks. That was an amazing story and we were listening to every word. And Michael and René, we're looking forward to visit you in Rotterdam after seeing all these amazing uh, images. Um, I would like to refer to some of the things that we're presenting he here today. OpenLM uh, has partnered with ServiceNow in the beginning of uh, 2019. Since then, uh, both companies uh, invested very significant efforts in the integration. I must say it wasn't easy. And we, in OpenLM, we view this as strategic for us. And um, I, we think that the integrated solution can highly enhance the value of the solution to the customer. And I would like to refer to some of the concepts that Zaki mentioned in his talk. And to shortly explain how did we implement these in OpenLM. So let's go back. Traditionally in engineering licenses, um, let's look a few years back how it worked. And as Zaki said, we see a classic silo management. Um, it's a district system of records, no visibility, no history, and each license, mem license manager has its own that data model. And um, working with you over the last few years, we managed to create a global system of records for all license managers, regardless of type, location, department. We created the visibility across all the different departments within the organization. So if I'm borrowing Zaki's uh, words, OpenLM actually created the platform of platforms for engineering licensing. The common customer for most of the people that are here with us today is the engineering department, but if we are more specific, the engineer. Our role is to make sure that engineers will get the licenses they need at the time they need it. 
And the easiest way to achieve this is to dedicate a license for each engineer. But this is also the most expensive way. And as engineer is, engineering is largely the art of balancing competing trades off, we are working with you in order to get the best ex experience possible for the minimum cost. So if we look at the engineer experience a few years ago, you might remember a, a blast email. Uh, can someone release this feature? It's urgent. Calls to users that left idle software on their desktops and people that keep licenses without using them just in case they might need them in the future. Working with you over the last few years, we have completely changed this experience. Engineers can now easily know what is the license availability and who is actually consuming the license. When getting a license denial, your engineer can lean back and do something else while we, we will automatically update him when the requested license becomes available. Some of your engineers might get angry when we close and save their project and release their license back to the license pool but actually the same engineers are very happy when they get the license they need. They have automatic, since we have automatically harvest either licenses that other users were not actually using. Visibility is another critical factor for a successful licensing system. As we start new projects with customer, we still we are still surprised to see forgotten license manager such that nobody can really explain why they continue to maintain for the last few years. In other cases, we see license managers serving much too many licenses that nobody is actually using. Why is this happening? Why is it possible since there is no visibility? Can you imagine a company where in the front parking lot you see many trucks standing for years covered with dust nobody is using probably not this will never happen can you imagine this now in the back parking lot that nobody sees probably yes what can we conclude visibility to all stakeholders into the licensing data is critical OpenLM is a global system of records for engineering licenses, regardless of the license manager type, vendor, or location. We provide a unified data model that allows organization to get to licenses decision based on real and accurate usage data. We provide a role-based permission system, permission system that allows you to grant access to stakeholders only to, a specific, to the specific information they need, keeping users' privacy. The integration with ServiceNow allows you to manage the engineering licensing in the same way you are managing any other software asset, having the same software lifecycle for each asset, regardless of its type, is a huge benefit. Being a single global system of records for all engineering applications, OpenLM connects people to better handle organization resources and unlock productivity by assuring license availability to engineers. Automation and workflows is also something that we in OpenLM believe in. We view this as a critical part of the creation of a re resilience licensing system. Just three examples out of many that shows how we implement it. Adding and updating license file is done automatically from the browser interface. An alerting system allows us to resolve issue even before the end user notices and report it. When it's impossible to solve automatically, we notify the people that can solve it to allow a, a, a quick result. License applications to people that are joining 
license, I'm sorry, license allocation to people that are joining the company or move from one department to another are done fully automatically once you configure the allocations you need. These are only some examples of how we implement this concept that we in OpenLM believe. And uh, before we close, I would like to thank you for taking the time to join today. We're looking forward to working with you since our best ideas are actually yours. We only implemented them. Now, I, I want to tell you a short story. So I was very proud uh, about the number of people that came to join today. And actually, so I went home and told my wife, look, we have so many users that all came to gather together and hear what we have to say, want to say. And um, she actually put the proportion uh, in, in place. So uh, maybe you heard about the BTS band. It's a boys band from Korea. And she just had a, a virtual show because they couldn't do it uh, live with Corona. And they actually managed to get 114 million people to the show. <laughs> so if, if you imagine that, if you put them holding hands like this, they almost cover half of the perimeter of the United States. So that's actually amazing. So thank you for, for being with us today. And I'm looking forward to meeting you in the next year conference. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Okay. Actually, this concludes our conference for today. I would like to thank the wonderful speakers that helped us make this event as wonderful as it was. Branislav, René, Michael, Zaki, and Jason, thank you very much for your help, your time, and your efforts. I hope each and every one of you learned something new today. And more than that, I really hope to see us with us next year. Thank you and have a wonderful evening.